Chapter Thirty One of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The White Dawn. Lifting Juana in his arms, Leonard hurried from the sleeping apartment to the throne room, where he halted, hesitating, for he did not know what was to happen next. Soa, who had preceded him, surrounded by the four priests, and with a torch in her hand, stood against the wall of the chamber where she had laid bound on the night of the drugging of Otter. Balpate has fainted with fear. He is a coward, she said to the priests, pointing to the burden in Leonard's arm. Open the secret way and let us pass on. Then a priest came forward, and pressing upon a stone in the wall, which gave way, leaving a space sufficiently large for him to insert his hand, and pull upon some hidden mechanism with all his force. Thereon, a piece of the wall swung outward, as though on a pivot, revealing a flight of steps beyond, which ran a narrow passage. So it descended first, bearing the light, which she was careful to hold in such a way as to keep the figure of Leonard and the burden that he bore in comparative darkness. After her went two priests, followed by Leonard carrying Juana, the rear being brought up by the remaining priests, who closed the secret door behind them. So that is how it is done, thought Leonard to himself, turning his head to watch the process, no detail of which escaped him. Otter, who had followed Leonard from Juana's chamber, saw them go, though from some little distance, for like a cat, the dwarf could see in the dark. When the rock had closed again, he returned to Francisco, who sat upon the bed lost in prayer or thought. I have seen how they make a hole in the wall, he said, and pass through it. Doubtless our comrades, the settlement men, went that way. Say, shall we try it? What is the use, Otter, answered the priest. The road leads only to the dungeon of the temple. If we got so far, we should be caught there, and everything would be discovered, including this trick and he pointed to the robes of Aka, which he wore. That is true, said Otter. Come then, let us go and sit upon the thrones, and wait till they fetch us. So they went to the great chairs and sat themselves down in them, listening to the tramp of the guards outside the doorway. Here Francisco resumed his prayers, while Otter sang songs of the deeds that he had done. More especially, a very long one, which he had composed upon the taking of the slave camp, to keep his heart alive, as he explained to Francisco. A quarter of an hour passed, and then the curtains were drawn aside, omitting a band of priests headed by Nam, and bearing two litters. Now silence, Otter, whispered Francisco, drawing his hood over his face. Here sits the god, said Nam, waving the torch he carried towards the two quiet figures on the thrones. Descend, ye gods, that we may bear you to the temple, and seat you in a lofty place, whence ye shall watch the glories of the rising sun. Then, without more ado, Otter and Francisco came down from their seats and took their places at the litters. Presently they felt themselves being borne forward at a considerable speed. When they were outside the palace gates, Otter peered through the curtain in hope of perceiving some change in the weather. In vain. The mist was denser than usual, although it grew gray with the light of the coming dawn. Now they were at those gates of the temple that were nearest to the colossal idol, and here, at the mouth of the numerous underground passages, guards assisted them to descend. Farewell, queen, whispered the voice of Olfen in Francisco's ear. I would have given my life to save you, but I have failed. As it is, I live to avenge you upon Nam and all his servants. Francisco made no answer, but pressed on down the passage, holding his head low. Soon they were at the foot of the idol, and, led by priests, began to ascend the stairway in the interior of the statue. Up they toiled slowly in the utter darkness. Indeed, to Francisco, this, the last journey of his life, seemed the longest. 
At length they emerged upon the head of the Colossus, where neither of them had been before. It formed a flat platform about eight feet square, quite unprotected at the edges, beneath which curved the sheer outlines of the sculptured head. The ivory throne whereupon Dwana had sat, when first she visited the temple, was gone, and instead of it, placed at the verge of the forehead, were two wooden stools upon which the victims must seat themselves. From this horrible elevation could be seen that narrow space of rock between the feet of the colossus and the wall of the pool, where was the stone altar, although, owing to the slope of the bowed head, he who stood upon it almost overhung the waters of the well. Otter and Francisco seated themselves on the stools, and behind them Nam and three other priests took their stand, Nam placing himself in such a position that his companions could not see anything of Francisco's slight form, which they believed to be that of the shepherdess. "'Hold me, Otter,' whispered Francisco. "'My senses will leave me, and I shall fall.' "'Shut your eyes and lean back, then you will see nothing,' answered Otter. "'Moreover, make ready your medicine, for the time is at hand.' "'It is ready,' he answered. "'May I be forgiven the sin, for I could not bear to be hurled living to the snake.' Otter made no answer, but set himself to watch the scene beneath him. The temple was filled with mist that from the great height looked like smoke, and through this veil he could just distinguish the black and moving mass of the vast assembly, who had sat the long night through, waiting to witness the consummation of the tragedy, while the sound of their voices, as they spoke together in hushed tones, reached him like that of the murmuring of distant waters. Behind him stood the four priests, or executioners, in a solemn, silent line, their eyes fixed upon the gray mist, while above them, around them, and beneath them was nothing but sheer and giddy space. It was a hideous position, heightened by every terror that man and nature can command, and even the intrepid dwarf, who feared neither death nor devil, and over whom religious doubts had no power, began to feel its chilling influence grip his heart. As for Francisco, such mind as he had left to him was taken up with fervent prayer, so it is possible that he did not suffer so much as might have been expected. Five minutes or more passed thus, then a voice spoke from the mist below, saying, Are those who are named Aka and Yal on high, O priest? They are on high, answered Nam. Is it the hour of dawn, O priest, said the voice again, and this time Otter knew it for that of the spokesman of the elders. Not yet a while, answered Nam, and he glanced at the snow peak that towered thousands of feet into the air behind and above the temple. Indeed, every eye in that assembly was staring at this peak, although its gigantic outline could only be seen dimly through the mist, dimly as the shape of a corpse buried in a winding sheet of snow. Here, upon the loftiest precipice of the mountain, the full light of morning struck first, and struck always, for the pinnacles soared far above the level of the mist wreaths, and by the quality of that light this people judged the weather of the newborn day. If the snow was rosy red, then they knew that ere long the sun would shine upon them. If, on the other hand, it gleamed cold and white, or still worse gray, it was a sign that the coming day would be misty in the city and on the plains. Therefore in this, the hour of the trial of the gods, whom they had set up, all that company watched the mountain peak as they had never watched before, to see if it should show white or red. Very gradually the light increased, and it seemed to Otter that the mist was somewhat thinner than was usual at this hour, though as yet it hung densely between them and the mountain snows. Now he could trace the walls of the amphitheater. Now he could see the black shimmer of the water beneath, 
and distinguished the glitter of the many hundreds of upturned eyeballs as they glared at him and beyond him. The silence grew more and more intense, for no one spoke or moved. All were waiting to see the dawn break upon the slope of snow, and wondering, would it be red or white? Must the gods die or live? So intense and fearful was the hush, unbroken by a breath of air or the calling of a bird, that Otter could bear it no longer, but suddenly burst into song. He had a fine, deep voice, and it was a Zulu war song that he sang, the triumphant paean of the rush of conquering impis interspersed with the wails of women and the groans of the dying. Louder and louder he sang, stamping his naked feet upon the rock, while the people wondered at the marvel. Surely this was a god, they thought, who chanted thus exultingly in a strange tongue while men waited to see him cast into the jaws of the snake. No mortal about to die so soon, and thus terribly, could find the heart to sing, and much less could he sing such a song as that they heard. He is a god, cried a voice far away, and the cry was echoed on every side, till at length, suddenly, the men grew silent, and Otter also ceased from his singing, for he had turned his head and seen. Lo, the veil of mist that hid the mountain's upper height grew thin. It was the moment of dawn, but would it be a red dawn or a white? As he looked, the vapors disappeared from the peak, though they still lay thick upon the slopes below, and in their place were seen its smooth and shining outlines clothed in a cloak of everlasting snows. The ordeal was ended. No touch of color, no golden sunbeam or crimson shadow stained the ghastly surface of those snows. They were pallid as the faces of the dead. A white dawn, a white dawn, roared the populace. Away with the false gods, hurl them to the snake. It is finished, whispered Otter, again into Francisco's ear. Now take your medicine, and friend, farewell. The priest heard, and clasping his thin hands together, turned his tormented face, in which the soft eyes shone, upward, towards the heavens. For some seconds he sat thus, and then Otter, peering beneath his hood, saw his countenance change and once more a glory seemed to shine upon it, as it had shown when, some hours since, Francisco promised to do the deed that now he was about to dare. And there was silence below, for the spokesman of the Council of Elders had risen, and was crying the formal question to the priests above. Is the dawn white or red, ye who stand on high? Nam turned and looked upon the snow. The dawn is fully dawned, and it is white, he answered. Be swift, whispered Otter, into Francisco's ear. Then the priest raised his right hand to his lips, as though to partake of the sacrament of death. A moment later, and he let it fall with a sigh, whispering back to Otter, I cannot, it is a deadly sin. They must kill me, for I will not kill myself. Before the dwarf could answer, nature more merciful than his conscience, did that for Francisco, which he refused to do for himself, for of a sudden he swooned. His face turned ashen, and slowly he began to sink backwards, so that he would have fallen had not Nam, who saw that he had fainted with fear, caught him by the shoulders and held him upright. The dawn is white, we see it with our eyes, answered the spokesman of the elders. O ye who stand on high, cast down the false gods according to the judgment of the people of the mist. Otter heard and knew that the moment had come to leap, for now he need trouble himself with Francisco no more. Swiftly he turned his head looking for Nam, for he would know if he might carry out a purpose that he had formed. It was to seize the high priest and bear him to the depths below. It was not possible. He was out of reach. Moreover, were he to snatch Nam away, Francisco would fall backwards, 
and the others might see that this was not the shepherdess. Otter stood up upon his feet, and kicking the stool on which he had sat off the platform. He watched its flight. It flew into the water, never touching the rock, and then the dwarf knew that he had planned well. Now Nam and one priest seized the fainting form of Francisco, and the other two stepped toward Otter. The dwarf waited till their hands were outstretched to grasp him. Then suddenly he sprang at the man upon his right, and shouting, Come thou with me, he gripped him about the middle in his iron grasp, and putting out all his strength, hurled himself and his burden into sheer space beneath. The priest shrieked aloud, and a gasp of wonder went up from the watching thousands as the dwarf and his victim rushed downward like a stone. They cleared the edge of the pool by an inch or two, no more, and struck the boiling waters, sinking through them till Otter thought that they would never rise again. But at last they did rise. Then Otter loosened the dead or senseless priest, and at that moment the body of Francisco, cast thither by Nam, struck the water beside him, and straightway vanished forever. Otter loosened his grip and diving beneath the surface, swam hard for the north side of the pool, for there he had noticed that the current was least strong, and there also the rock bank overhung a little. He reached it safely, and rising once more, grasped a knob of rock with one hand, and lay still where in the shadow and the swirl of waters he could not be discovered by any watching from above. He breathed deeply, and moved his limbs. It was well he was unhurt. The priest, whom he had taken with him, being heaviest, had met the water first, so that though the leap was great, the shock had been little. Ha, said Otter to himself, thus far my spirit has been with me, and here I could lie for hours and never be seen. But there is still the snake to contend with, and hastily he seized the weapon that he had constructed out of the two knives, and unwound a portion of the cord that was fast about his middle. Then again he looked across the surface of the waters. Some ten phantoms from him, in the exact center of the whirlpool, the body of the priest was still visible, for the vortex bore it round and round, but of Francisco there was nothing to be seen. Only thirty feet above him, Otter, could see lines of heads bending over rocky edges of the pool and gazing at the priest as he was tossed about like a straw in an eddy. Now, if he is still there and awake, thought Otter, surely the father of crocodiles will take this bait. Therefore, I shall do my best to be still a while and see what happens. As he reflected thus, a louder shout than any he had heard before reached his ears from the multitude in the temple above him, so tumultuous a shout, indeed, that for a few moments even the turmoil of the waters was lost in it. Now what chance is up there, I wonder, thought Otter again. Then his attention was diverted in a somewhat unpleasant fashion. This was the cause of that shout. A miracle, or what the people of the mist took to be a miracle, had come about for suddenly, for the first time within the memory of man, the white dawn had changed to red. Blood red was the snow upon the mountain, and lo, its peaks were turned to fire. For a while all those who witnessed this phenomenon stood aghast. Then there arose the babble of voices which had reached the ears of Otter as he lurked under the bank of rock. The gods have been sacrificed unjustly, yelled the people, they are true gods, see, the dawn is red. The situation was curious and most unexpected, but Nam, who had been a high priest for more than fifty years, proved himself equal to it. This is a marvel indeed, he cried, when silence had at length been restored, for no such thing is told in our history as that a white dawn upon the mountain should turn to red. Yet, O oh people of the mist, those whom we thought gods have not been offered up wrongfully. No, this is the meaning of the sign. Now 
are the true gods Aka and Yal appeased, because those who dare to usurp their power have gone down to doom. Therefore, the curse is lifted from the land, and the sunlight has come back to bless us. As he finished speaking, again the tumult broke out, some crying this thing and some that. But no action was taken, for Nam's excuse was ready and plausible, and the minds of men were confused. So the assembly broke up in disorder. Only the priests, and as many more as could find place, often among them, crowded round the edges of the pool to see what happened in its depths. Meanwhile, Otter had seen that which caused him to think no more of the shouting above him than of the humming of last year's gnats. Suffering his eyes to travel round the circumference of the rocky wall, he saw the mouth of a circular hole, situated immediately under the base of the idol, which may have measured some eight feet in diameter. The lower edge of this hole stood about six inches above the level of the pool, and water ran out of it in a thin stream. Passing down this stream, half swimming and half waddling, appeared the huge and ungainly reptile, which was the real object of the worship of the people of the mist. Great as were its length and bulk, the dwarf saw it, but for a few moments so swift were its movements. Then the creature vanished into the deep waters, to reappear presently by the side of the dead priest, who was now beginning to sink. Its horrible head rose upon the waters, as on that night when the woman had been thrown to it, it opened its huge jaws, and seizing the body of the man across the middle, it disappeared beneath the foam. Otter watched the mouth of the hole, and not in vain, for before he could have counted the ten, the monster was crawling through it, bearing its prey into the cave. Now once more the dwarf felt afraid, for the snake, or rather the crocodile, at close quarters, was far more fearful than anything that his imagination had portrayed. Keeping his place beneath the ledge, which, except for the coldness of the water, he found himself able to do with little fatigue or difficulty, Otter searched the walls of the pool, seeking for some possible avenue of escape, since in his ardor for personal conflict with this reptile had evaporated. But search as he would, he could find nothing. The walls were full thirty feet high, and sloped inwards, like the sides of an inverted funnel. Wherever the exits from the pool might be, they were invisible. Also, notwithstanding his strength and skill, Otter did not dare swim into the furious eddy to look for them. One thing he noticed, indeed, immediately above the entrance to the crocodile's den, and some twenty feet from the level of the water, two holes were pierced in the rock, six feet or so apart, each measuring about twelve inches square. But these holes were not to be reached, and even if reached, they were too small to pass, so Otter thought no more of them. Now the cold was beginning to nip him, and he felt that if he stayed where he was much longer, he would become paralyzed by it, for it was fed from the ice and snows above. Therefore, it would seem that there was but one thing to do, to face the water-dweller in his lair. To this, then, Otter made up his mind, albeit with loathing and a doubtful heart. End of chapter 31「Chapter thirty two of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How Otter Fought the Water Dweller. Keeping himself carefully under the overshadowing edge of the rock bank, and holding his double bladed knife ready in one hand, Otter swam to the mouth of the snake's den. As he approached it, he perceived by the great upward force of the water that the real body of the stream entered the pool from below, the hole where the crocodile lived being a supplementary exit, which doubtless the river flowed 
in times of flood. Otter reached the mouth of the tunnel without any great difficulty, and watching his chance, he lifted himself on his hands and slipped through it quickly, for he did not desire to be seen by those who were gathered above. Nor indeed was he seen, for his red headdress and the goatskin cloak had been washed away or cast off in the pool, and in that light his black body made little show against the black rock beneath. Now he was inside the hole, and he found himself crouching upon a bed of sand, or rather disintegrated rock, brought down by the waters. The gloom of the place was great, but the light of the white dawn, which had turned to red, was gathering swiftly on the surface of the pool, without as the mist melted, and thence was reflected into the tunnel. So it came about that very soon Otter, who had the gift, not uncommon among savages, of seeing in anything short of absolute darkness, was able to make out his surroundings with tolerable accuracy. The place in a corner of which he squatted was a cave of no great height or width, hallowed in the solid rock by the force of water, as smoothly as though it had been hewn by hand of man, in short, an enormous natural drain pipe, but constructed of stone instead of earthenware. In the bottom of this drain trickled a stream of water, nowhere more than six inches deep, and on either side of which, for ten feet or more, lay a thick bed of debris ground small. How far the cave stretched, of course, he could not see, nor as yet could he discover, the whereabouts of its hideous occupant though traces of its presence were plentiful, for the sandy floor was marked with its huge footprints, and the air reeked with an abominable stink. Where has this evil spirit gone to, thought Otter? He must be near, and yet I can see nothing of him. Perhaps he lives further up the cave, and he crept a pace or two forward, and again peered into the gloom. Now he perceived what had hitherto escaped him. Namely, that some eight yards from the mouth of the tunnel, a table-shaped fragment of stone rose from its floor to within six feet of the roof, having on the hither side a sloping plain that connected its summit with the stream bed beneath. Doubtless this fragment or boulder, being of some harder material than the surrounding rock, had resisted the wear of the rushing river. The top of it, as was shown by the high-water marks, on the sides of the cave, being above the level of the torrent, which, although it was now represented only by a rivulet, evidently at certain seasons of the year, poured down with great force and volume. Here is a bed on which a crocodile might sleep, reflected Otter, creeping a little bit forward and staring at the mass of rock, and more especially at a triangular-shaped object that was poised on top of the sloping plain and on something which lay beneath it. Now if that thing be another stone, thought Otter, how comes it that it does not slip into the water as it should do? And what is that upon which it rests? And he took a step to one side to prevent his body from intercepting any portion of the ray of light that momentarily shone clearer and pierced the darkness of the cave to a greater distance. Then he looked again and almost fell in his horror for now he could see all. The thing that he had taken for a stone set upon the rock table was the head of the dweller in the waters, for there in it, as the light struck on them, two dreadful eyes gleamed with a dull and changing fire. Moreover, he discovered what was the object which lay under the throat of the reptile. It was the body of that priest whom Otter had taken with him in his leap from the statue for he could see the dead face projecting on one side. Perhaps if I wait a while, he will begin to eat him, reflected the dwarf. Remember the habits of crocodiles, and then I can attack him when he rests and sleeps afterwards. And acting on this idea, he stood still, watching the green fire as it throbbed and quivered, waxed and waned in the monster's eyes. How long he remained thus, Otter never knew. But after a time, he became conscious that these eyes had taken hold of him and were drawing him toward them. 
though whether the reptile saw him or not he could not tell. For a space he struggled against this unholy fascination. Then, overcome by dread, he strove to fly back to the pool or anywhere out of reach of those devilish orbs. Alas, it was too late. No step could he move backwards. No, not to save his life. Now he must go on. It was as though the water-dweller had read his mind and drew its foe towards itself to put the matter to the test. Otter took one step forward. Rather, would he have sprung again off the head of the Colossus, and the eyes glowed more dreadfully than ever, as though in triumph. Then in despair he sank to the ground, hiding his face in his hands and groaning in his heart. This is a devil that I have come to fight, a devil with magic in his eyes, he thought. And how can I, who am but a common knob-nosed dwarf, do battle against the king of evil spirits, clothed in the shape of a crocodile? Even now, when he could not see them, he felt the eyes drawing him. Yet, as they were no longer visible, his courage and power of mind came back to him sufficiently to enable him to think again. Otter, he said to himself, if you stay thus, soon the magic will do its work. Your senses will leave you, and that devil will eat you up as a cobra devours a mere cat. Yes, he will swallow you, and his inside will be your grave, and that is no end for one who has been called a god. Man, let alone gods, should die fighting, whether it be with other men, with wild beasts, with snakes, or with devils. Think now, if your master, the Deliverer, saw you crouch thus like a toad before an adder, how he would laugh and say, Oh, I thought this man brave. Ho, oh, he talked very loud about fighting the water-dweller, he who came of a line of warriors. But now I laugh at him, for I see that he is but a cross-bred cur and a coward. Yes, yes, you can hear his words, Otter. Say now, Will you bear their shame and sit here until you are snapped up and swallowed? Thus the dwarf addressed himself, and it seemed to his bewildered brain that the words which he imagined were true, and that Leonard really stood by and mocked him. At last he sprang to his feet and crying, Never, boss! So loudly that the cave rang with the echoes of his shout, he rushed straight at the foe, holding the two-bladed knife in his right hand. The crocodile that was waiting for him to fall insensible, as had ever been the custom of the living victims on whom it fixed its baneful glare, heard his cry and awoke from its seeming toper. It lifted its head. Fire seemed to flash from its dull eyes. Its vast length began to stir. Higher and higher it reared its head. Then of a sudden it leaped from the slope of rock. As alligators, when disturbed, leaped from the river bank into the water, coming so heavily to the ground that the shock caused the cave to tremble, and stood before the dwarf with its tail arched upwards over its back. Again Otter shouted, half in rage and half in terror, and the sound seemed to make the brute more furious. It opened its huge mouth as though to seize him, and waddled a few paces forward, halting within six feet of him. Now the dwarf's chance had come, and he knew it. For with the opportunity, all his courage and skill returned to him. It was he who sprang, and not the crocodile. He sprang. He thrust his arm and the double knife far into the yawning mouth, and for a second held it there, one end pointing upward to the brain and one to the tongue beneath. He felt the jaws close, but their rows of yellow fangs never touched his arm for there was that between them which held them some little space apart. Then he cast himself on one side and to the ground, leaving the weapon in the reptile's throat. For a few moments it shook its horrible head, while Otter watched gasping, for the reek of the brute's breath almost overpowered him. Twice it opened its great jaw and spat, and twice it strove to close them. Oh! What if it should rid itself of the knife, or drive it through the soft flesh of the throat? Then he was lost indeed. But this might not do. 
for the lower blade caught upon the jawbone. And at each effort it drove the sharp point of the upper knife deeper towards its brain. Moreover, so good was the steel, and so firm were the hide bindings of the handles, shrunken as they were with the wet, that nothing broke or gave. Now he will trample me or dash me to pieces with his tail, said Otter. But as yet the snake had no such mind. Indeed, in its agony, it seemed to have forgotten the presence of its foe. It writhed upon the floor of the cave, lashing the rock with its tail, and gasping horribly the while. Then suddenly it started forward past him, and the tough hide rope about Otter's middle ran out like the line from the bow of a whaleboat when the harpoon has gone home in the quarry. Thrice the dwarf spun round violently. Then he felt himself dragged in great jerks along the rocky floor, which, happily for him, was smooth. A fourth jerk, and once more he was in the waters of the pool, aye, and being carried to its remotest depths. Now he is mad, thought Otter, who ties himself to such a fish as this, for it will drown me ere it dies. Had Otter been any other man, doubtless this would have been so, but he was as nearly amphibious as a human being can be and could dive and swim and hold his breath, yes, and see beneath the surface, as well as the animal from which he took his name. Never did such gifts stand their owner in better stead than during the minutes of this strange duel. Twice the tortured reptile sank to the bottom of the pool, and its depth was great, dragging the dwarf after it, though, as it chanced, between dives, it rose to the surface, giving him time to breathe. A third time it dived, and Otter must follow it, on this occasion to the mouth of one of the subterranean exits of water, into which the dwarf was sucked. Then the brute turned, and heading up the pool, with the speed of a hooked salmon, and Otter, who had prayed that the line would break, now prayed that it might hold, for he knew that even he could never hope to swim against that undertow. It held and once more they rose to the surface, where the reptile lay lashing the waters in its pain, blood pouring from its mouth and nostrils. Very glad was Otter to be able to breathe again, for during that last rush he had gone near to suffocation. He lifted his head, inhaling the air with great gulps, and saw that the banks of the pool were lined with spectators who shouted and surged in their mad excitement. After that, he did not see much more for a while, since just then it seemed to occur to the crocodile, for the first time, that the man alongside of him was the cause of his suffering. At least it wallowed around, causing the waters to boil about its horny sides, and charged him. With its fangs it could not bite, therefore it struck at him with its tail. Twice Otter dived, avoiding the blows, but the third time he was not so successful, for the reptile followed him into the deep water and dealt him a fearful stroke before he could either sink or rise. He felt the rough scales cut into his flesh and a sensation as though every bone in his body was breaking and his eyes were starting from his head. Faintly and more faintly he struggled, but in vain, for now life and sense were leaving him together and everything grew black. But suddenly there came a change, and Otter knew vaguely that again he was being dragged through the water and over rock. Then darkness took him, and he remembered no more. When the dwarf awoke, it was to find himself lying on the floor of the cave, but not alone, for by his side, twisted into a last and hideous contortion, lay the snake god, dead. The upper part of the double knife had worked itself into its brain and with a dying effort it sought the den where it had lived for centuries, dragging Otter with it, and there expired, how or when, he knew not. But the dwarf had triumphed. Before him was stretched the ancient terror of the people of the mist, the symbol and, indeed, the object of their worship, slain by his skill and valor. Otter saw, and bruised and shaken as he was, his heart swelled with pride 
for had he not done a deed single-handed, such as was not told of in the stories of this land? Oh, that the boss were here to see this sight, he said, as he crawled along the length of his dead enemy, and seated himself upon its flat and loathsome snout. Alas, he cannot, he added, but I pray that my watching spirit may spare my life that I may live to sing the song of the slain of the devil of the people of the mist. Wow, that was a fight. When shall a man see another? And lo, save for many bruises and the cutting of the rope about my middle, I am not greatly hurt, for the water broke the weight of his tail when he smote me with it. After all, it is well that the line held, for it served to drag me from the pool as it had dragged me into it. Otherwise... I had surely drowned there. See, though, it is nearly done with, and grasping that end of the cord which hung from the jaws of the crocodile, he broke it with a jerk, for with the exception of half a strand, it was frayed through by the worn fangs. Thus having rested himself a little and washed the worst of his hurts with water, Otter set himself to consider the position. First, however, he made an utterly ineffectual effort to extract the great knives. Ten men could not have moved them, for the upper blade was driven many inches deep into the bone and muscle of the reptile's massive head. But for this chance, it would have soon shaken itself clear of them. But as it was, every contortion and gnashing of its jaws had only served to drive the steel deeper, up to the hilt indeed. Abandoning this attempt, the dwarf crept cautiously to the mouth of the cave and peered at the further banks of the pool, whence he could hear shouts and see men moving to and fro, apparently in a state of great excitement. Now I am weary of that pool, he said to himself, and if I am seen in it, the great people will surely shoot at me with arrows and kill me. What shall I do, then? I cannot stay in this place of stink, with the dead devil and the bones of those whom he has devoured until I die of hunger. Yet this water must come from somewhere. Therefore it seems best that I should follow it a while, searching for the spot where it enters the cave. It will be dark walking, but the walls and the floor are smooth, so that I shall not hurt myself. And if I find nothing, I can return again and strive to escape from the pool by night. Having thus decided upon the adventure, Otter began to carry it out with characteristic promptness, the more readily, indeed, because of his long immersion, the water had chilled him, and he felt a weariness creeping over him as a result of the terrible struggle and emotions that he had passed through. Coiling the hide rope about his middle, which was sadly cut by its chafing, he started with an uncertain gait for he was still very weak. A few steps brought him to that rock on which he had discovered the head of the reptile, and he paused to examine it. Climbing the sloping stone, no easy task, for it was smooth as ice, he came to the table-like top. On its edge lay the body of that priest who had shared his fall from the head of the Colossus. Then he inspected the surface of the rock, and for the first time understood how old the monster must have been which he had conquered in single combat. For there, where his body had lain, from generation to generation, and perhaps from century to century, the hard material was worn away to the depth of two feet or more, while at the top of the sloping stone was a still deeper niche, where its head reposed as it lay, keeping its sleepless watch on the waters of the pool. Around this depression, and strewn about the floor of the cave itself, were the remains of many victims, a considerable number of whom had not been devoured. In every case, however, the larger bones were broken, and from this circumstance Otter judged that, although it was the custom of this dreadful reptile to crush the life out of all who were thrown to it with a bite of its fangs, yet, like that of other animals, its appetite was limited, and it was only occasionally that it consumed what it had killed. The sight of these remains was so unpleasant and suggestive that even Otter, 
who certainly could not be called squeamish, hastened to descend the rock. As he passed round it, his attention was attracted by the skeleton of a man who, from various indications, must have been alive within the last few weeks. The bones were clad in a priest's cloak, of which the dwarf, who was trembling with cold, hastened to possess himself. As he picked up the robe, he observed beneath it a bag of tanned oxhide that doubtless had once been carried by the owner of the cloak. Perhaps he kept food in this, thought Otter, though what he who came to visit the water-dweller should want with food I cannot guess. At the least, it will be bad by now, so I will leave it and be gone. Only a vulture would stay for long in this house of the dead. Then he started forward. For a few yards more he had light to guide his steps, but very soon the darkness became complete. Still the cave was not difficult to travel, for everywhere the rock was smooth and the water shallow. All that he needed to do was to walk straight on, keeping touch of one side of the tunnel with one hand. Indeed, he had but two things to fear, that he should fall into some pit and that he might suddenly encounter another crocodile. For doubtless, thought Otter, the devil was married. But Otter fell into no hole, and he saw no crocodile, since, as it chanced, the water-dweller of the people of the mist was a bachelor. When the dwarf had traveled up a steep slope for rather more than half an hour, to his intense joy, he saw light before him and hurried towards it. Presently he reached the further mouth of the cavern that was almost closed by blocks of ice, among which a little water trickled. Creeping through an aperture, he found himself upon the crest of the impassable precipice at the back of the city, and that before him a vast glacier of green ice stretched upwards, whereon the sun shone gloriously. End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of the People of the Mist by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Trapped. It will be remembered that some hours before Otter found himself in the light of day after his conquest of the reptile god, Leonard found himself in a very different place, namely, in a secret passage bearing the senseless form of Juanna in his arms and being guided by Soa, whither he knew not. On they went through the various tunnels, of the turnings of which Leonard tried to keep count in his mind, till at length Soa ushered him into a rock-hewn cell that evidently had been prepared for their reception. For on one side of it stood a bed covered with skin blankets, and on the other a table provided with the best food that the country could offer. At a sign from Soa, he laid Juanna down upon the bed, whereon the woman instantly threw a blanket over her, so as to hide her face from the eyes of the curious. Then of a sudden Leonard felt himself seized from behind, while his arms were held by two of the priests, a third, under Soa's direction, removed his revolver and hunting knife, which weapons were carried away. "'You treacherous hag,' said Leonard to Soa, "'be careful, lest I kill you. "'To kill me, deliverer, "'would be to kill yourself and another. "'These things are taken from you "'because it is not safe "'that you should have them. "'Such toys are not for angry children. "'Stay,' she said to the fourth priest, "'search his pockets.' "'The man did as he was ordered.' placing everything that Leonard had about him, such as his watch, Francisco's notebook and rosary, and the great ruby stone, in a little pile upon the table. Presently he came to the fragment of poison, which was wrapped in a square of kid skin. Soa took it, and after examination said, Why, Deliverer, you have been borrowing medicine. That will bring you bad luck if you keep it and going to a small aperture in the wall of the cell, she threw the tiny packet out of it, and after it a second packet, which Leonard recognized 
as have been taken from Juana's hair. There, now you cannot hurt yourself, she added in Portuguese. Let me tell you something. So long as you remain quiet, all will be well. But if you attempt violence or escape, then you shall be bound and placed by yourself. Also, you will bring about the death of the shepherdess yonder. Be warned then by me, white man, and turn gentle, for remember that my day has come at last, and you are in my power. That is very clear, my estimable friend, answered Leonard, controlling his wrath as best he might. But for your sake, I hope that the hour will never come when you shall be in mine. For then I may remember more than you wish. I do not in the least understand what you are aiming at, nor do I much care, so long as a certain person is protected. Do not fear, deliverer. She shall be protected. As you know well, I hate you, and yet I keep you alive, because without you she might die. Therefore, for her sake, be careful. Attempt no violence towards me or my father, if we visit you alone, for we shall do so in order that she may not be discovered, and the moment that you lift a hand against us, it will be the beginning of her doom. And now I must leave you for a while, for something passeth in the temple which I desire to see. If she awakens before I return, be careful not to frighten her. Farewell. Then Soa went taking the priest with her, and the massive timber door was closed upon them. After he had restored his various belongings to his pockets, the revolver and the knife, which had been removed, accepted, Leonard turned down the rug and looked at Juana, who appeared to be plunged in a deep and happy sleep, for there was a smile upon her face. Next he examined the place where they were confined. It had two doors, that by which they had entered, and a second of equal solidity. The only other opening was the slit out of which Soa had dropped the poison. It was shaped like an inverted loophole, the narrow end facing inward. This aperture attracted Leonard's attention, both on account of its unusual form and because of the sounds that reached him through it. Of these, the first and most pervading was a noise of rushing water. Then, after a while, he distinguished a roar, as of a multitude shouting, that was repeated again and again at intervals. Now he knew where they must be. They were hidden away in the rock of the temple, somewhere in the immediate neighborhood of the raging pool that lay in front of the Colossus, and these sounds which he heard were the clamor of the people who watched the fate of Otter and Francisco. This conviction was terrible enough, but had he known that, as it entered his mind, the body of his friend the priest was traveling on its last journey within four feet of his eyes, Leonard might have been even more prostrated than he was. For an hour or more the shouting continued, then followed a silence, broken only by the everlasting murmur of the waters without. When Soa departed she had left a fragment of dip made of goat fat burning upon the floor, but very soon this expired, leaving them in darkness. Now, however, light began to flow into the dungeon through the slit in the rock, and it seemed to Leonard that the character of this light was clearer than that to which they had been accustomed in this gloomy land. After a while, Leonard sat down upon a stool, which he placed close to Juana's bed, just where the beam of light pierced the shadows, and groaned aloud in the bitterness of his heart. It was over. The pure-hearted martyr Francisco was dead, and with him Otter, his faithful friend and servant, except Soa, who had become an active enemy, at least so far as he was concerned. Of all who traveled to this hellish country, Juana and he alone were left alive, and sooner or later fate must overtake them also. The greatest and last failure of his life was about to be consummated, and he will go down into a nameless grave, there to be lost, having for many years suffered and toiled to no purpose, pursuing a chimera. 
Juana still slept heavily under the influence of the drug, and he was glad of it, for when she woke it must be to a worse misery than any that had gone before. Partly for something to do, and partly because the cravings of nature made themselves felt even through his sorrows, Leonard turned to the table and ate and drank of the viands there, though not without fear that they might be doctored. As the food took effect upon him, some share of hope and courage entered into his heart, for it is a true saying that a full stomach makes a brave man. After all, they too still breathed and were unharmed in body, nor was it absolutely certain that they would be called upon to give up the ghost at present. This was much. Moreover, he had lived long enough to win the love of the fearless and beautiful girl who slept beside him, and though perhaps under such circumstances love, however true and passionate, ceases to occupy a commanding place in a man's heart, even then he felt that this was more, and that happier days might dawn when it would be, if not everything, at least most of all. As he thought thus he saw color creep into Juana's pale face. Then she sighed, opened her eyes, and sat up. "'Where am I?' she said, glancing round wildly. "'This is not the bed on which I lay down. Oh,' she started, "'is it over?' "'Hush, dear, hush, I am with you,' said Leonard, taking her hand. "'So I see. But where are the others? And what is this dreadful place? Are we buried alive, Leonard? It looks like a tomb.' "'No, we are only prisoners.' Come, eat and drink something, and then I will tell you the story. She rose to obey him, and for the first time her eyes fell upon the robe she wore. Why, this is Francisco's. Where is Francisco? Eat and drink, he repeated. She did his bidding mechanically, watching his face the while with wondering and frightened eyes. Now, she said, tell me, I can bear this no longer. Where are Francisco and Otter? Alas, Juana, they are dead, he answered solemnly. Dead, she wailed, wringing her hand. Francisco dead? Why then are we still alive? Have courage and listen, Juana. After you went to sleep in the palace, Soa came to us with a plan which we accepted. What was the plan? she asked hoarsely. Twice he strove to tell her, and twice he failed. The words would not come. Go on. Why do you torment me? It was this, Juana, that Francisco should be dressed in the robe of Aca and offered up with Otter in your place while you were hidden away. Has it been done? she whispered. I believe so, Leonard replied, bowing his head to his breast. We are prisoners in a secret cell beneath the feet of the statue. There has been great noise and confusion without and now for some time silence. Then Juana sprang up and stood over him with flashing eyes. How dare you do this, she said. Who gave you leave to do it? I thought that you were a man. Now I see that you are a coward. Juana, said Leonard, it is useless for you to talk like this. Whatever was done was done for your sake, not for that of anybody else. Oh, yes, you say so but I believe that you made a plot with Soa to murder Francisco in order that you might save your own life. I have done with you. I will never speak to you again. You can please yourself about that, answered Leonard, who by now was thoroughly enraged. But I am going to speak to you. Look here. You have said words to me for which, were you a man, I would do my best to be avenged upon you. But as you are a woman, I can only answer them, and then wash my hands of you. As you must know or will know, when you come to your right mind, I would gladly have taken Francisco's place, but it was impossible, for had I attempted to dress myself up in the robes of Aka, I should instantly have been discovered, and you would have paid the price of my folly. We all knew this, and after we had consulted, Things were arranged, as I have told you. I only consented to your being brought here on the condition that I was allowed to accompany you for your protection. Now I wish 
that I had left it alone and gone with Francisco. Then, perhaps, I should have found peace instead of bitter words and reproaches. However, do not be afraid, for I think it probable that I shall soon follow him. I know that you are very fond of this man, this hero, and also, by accident or design, that you had succeeded in making him a great deal too fond of you for his peace of mind. Therefore I make excuses for your conduct, which, with all such deductions, still remains perfectly intolerable. He paused and looked at her as she sat on the edge of the couch, biting her lip and glancing toward him now and again with a curious expression on her beautiful face, in which grief, pride, and anger all had their share. Yet at that moment Juana was thinking not of Francisco and his sacrifice, but of the man before her, whom she had never loved so well as now, when he spoke to her thus bitterly, paying her back in her own coin. "'I cannot pretend to match you in scolding and violence,' she said. "'Therefore I will give up argument. Perhaps, however, when you come to your right mind, you will remember that my life is my own, and that I gave nobody permission to save it at the cost of another person's. What is done is done, answered Leonard moodily, for his anger had burnt out. Another time I will not interfere without your express wish. By the way, my poor friend asked me to give you these, and he handed her the rosary and the notebook. He has written something for you to read on the last sheet of the journal, and he bade me say that, should you live to escape, he hoped that you will wear these in memory of him, and he touched the beads, and also that you would not forget him in your prayers. Juana took the journal, and holding it to the light, opened it at hazard. The first thing she saw was her own name, for in truth it contained, among many other matters, a record of the priest's unhappy infatuation from the first moment of their meeting, and also of his pious efforts to overcome it. Turning the pages rapidly, she came to the last on which there was any writing. It read as follows. Senora, of the circumstances under which I write these words, you will learn in due course. The pages of this journal should you deign to study them, will reveal to you my shameful weakness. But if I am a priest, I am also a man, who soon shall be neither, but as I hope, an immortal spirit. And the man in me, following those desires of the spirit that find expression through the flesh, has sinned and loved you. Forgive me this crime, as I trust it will be forgiven elsewhere, though myself I cannot pardon it. Be happy with that noble gentleman who has won your heart and who himself worships you as you deserve. May you be protected from all the dangers that now surround you, as I think you will, and may the blessings of heaven be with you and about you for many peaceful years, till at length you come to the peace that pathes understanding. And when from time to time you think of me, may you in your heart couple my name with certain holy words. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Senora, pardon me, and farewell. Juana read this touching and noble-hearted adieu with an ever-growing wonder, and when she had finished it, put down the book, crying aloud, Oh, what have I done to deserve such devotion as this? Then with a strange and bewildering in consequence, she flung herself into Leonard's arms, and bearing her head upon his breast, she began to weep. When she was somewhat calmer, he also read the letter and closed the book, saying, The world is poorer by a perfect gentleman. He was too good for any of us, Juana. I think so, she answered. Just then they heard a sound without the door. It opened and Nam entered, accompanied by Soa. Deliverer, said the aged priest, whose countenance and troubled eyes bore traces of many conflicting emotions. And you, shepherdess, I come to speak with you. As you see, I am alone, except for this woman, 
but should you attempt any violence toward her or me, that will be the signal for your deaths. With much toil, and at no little risk to myself, I have spared the life of the shepherdess, causing the white man, your companion, to be offered up in her place. Has that offering been accomplished, broke in Leonard, who could not restrain his anxiety to learn what had happened. I will be frank with you, deliverer, answered the high priest, when Juana had translated his question, since the truth cannot hurt me, for now we know too much of one another's secrets to waste time in bandying lies. I know, for instance, that the shepherdess and the dwarf are no gods, but mortals like ourselves, and you know that I have dared to affront the true gods by changing the victim whom they had chosen. The sacrifice has been accomplished, but with so many signs and wonders that I am bewildered. The people of the mist are bewildered also, so that none know what to think. The white man, your companion, was hurled fainting into the waters when the dawn had broken upon the mountain and was seen to be gray. But the dwarf, your servant, did not wait to have that office done for him, for he sprang thither himself, I, and took one with him. Brave Otter, cried Leonard, I knew that you would die hard. Hard did he die indeed, deliverer, said Nam with a sigh, so hard that even now many swear that he was a god and not a man. Scarcely had they all vanished into the pool when a wonder chanced such has not been told of in our records. Deliverer, the white dawn turned to red, perchance, as I cried to calm the people, because the false gods had met their doom. Then the true ones must be singularly blind, said Juana, seeing that I, whom you dare to call a false god, am still alive. This argument silenced Nam for a moment, but presently he answered. Yes, shepherdess, you are still alive, he said, laying a curious emphasis on the still. And indeed, he added hastily, if you are not foolish, you may long remain so, both of you, for I have no desire to shed your blood, who only seek to end my last days in peace. But listen to the end of the tale. While the people wondered at the omen of the changed dawn, it was seen that the dwarf, your servant, was not dead there in the pool. Yes, this was seen, deliverer. To and fro in the troubled waters rushed the great water-dweller, and after him, Keeping pace with him went that dwarf who was named Otter. Aye, round and round and down to the lowest depths, though how it could be that a man might swim with a snake, none can say. Oh, bravo, Otter, said Leonard again, bethinking himself of an explanation of the mystery which he did not reveal to Nam. Well, what was the end of it? That none know for certain, deliverer, answered the priest perplexedly. At last the water-dweller, from whose mouth poured blood, was seen to sink with the dwarf. Then he rose again and entered the cave, his home. But whether the dwarf entered with him or no, I cannot say, for some swear one thing and some another, and in the foam and shadow it was hard to see. Moreover, none will venture there to learn the truth. Well, dead or alive, he made a good fight for it, said Leonard. And now, Nam, what is your business with us? This question appeared to puzzle the priest a little, for, to speak the truth, he did not care to disclose the exact nature of his business, which was to separate Leonard from Juana, without force if possible. I came here, deliverer, he answered, to tell you what had happened. Exactly, said Leonard to tell me that you have murdered my best friend, and one who is but lately your god. I thank you for your news, Nam, and now, if I might make bold to ask, what are your plans with reference to ourselves, I mean, until it suits you, to send us after our companions? Believe me, Deliverer, my plan is to save your lives. If the others have been sacrificed, it was no fault of mine, for there are forces behind me, that I cannot control even when I guide them. The land is in confusion, and full of strange rumors. I know not what may happen during the next few days. 
but till they are over you must lie hid. This is a poor place in which to dwell, but there is none other safer and secret. Still, here is another chamber which you can use. Perchance you have already seen it. And placing his hand upon what appeared to be a latch, he opened the second door which Leonard had noticed previously, revealing a cell of very similar construction to that in which they were, and of somewhat larger size. See, deliverer, he went on, here is the place, and he stepped forward to enter the cell, then drew back as though in courtesy to allow Leonard to pass in before him. For once Leonard's caution forsook him, for at the moment he was thinking of other things. Almost mechanically he passed the threshold. Scarcely were his feet over it when he remembered the character of his host and the lodging, and turned quickly to come back. It was too late, for even as he turned, the heavy timber door closed in his face with a crash, and he was caged. End of chapter 33「Chapter Thirty Four of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nam's Last Argument. For a moment Juana stood stupefied, for the maneuver had been so sudden that at first she could scarcely realize its results. Now, Shepherdess began Nam blandly, we can talk in private, for I have words to say to you which it is not fitting that other ears should hear. You fiend, she answered fiercely, then comprehending that violence or remonstrance would be useless, she added, Speak on, I hear you. Listen, Shepherdess, and for your own sake I implore you, do not give way to grief or rage. I swear to you that no harm shall come to yonder man, if you will but do my bidding. Shepherdess, you are found out. I know, and the people know, that you are no goddess. It had been safer to sacrifice you today, but partly because of the pleading of my daughter, who loves you, and partly for other reasons, I have caused you to be saved alive. Now, Shepherdess, from this country there is no escape. As you have chosen to come hither, here you must remain for life, and in this cell you cannot live and die. Therefore, for my daughter's sake, I have cast about for a means to deliver you from your bonds and set you high in the land, I almost at its head. And he paused. Perhaps you will come to the point, said Juana, who was trembling with fear and anger. It is this, Shepherdess, Nam answered, bowing. Although you are dethroned as a goddess, you may still shine as a queen and rule over us as the wife of our king. Indeed, replied Juana, turning suddenly cold. And how shall I, who am held to be dead, appear again as a woman wedded to your king? Surely the people would find that strange, Nam. No, Shepherdess, for I have prepared a tale which shall explain the wonder, and already its rumor runs from mouth to mouth. It will be said that you were a goddess, and therefore immortal, but that for the sake of love you have put off your godhead and put on the flesh, that you might dwell for some years with him whom you desire. Indeed, said Juana again, and what if I refuse to consent to this scheme, which, as I think, can have come only from a woman's brain? And she pointed to Soa. You are right, Shepherdess, answered Soa. The plan is mine. I made it to save you, and also, she added coolly, to be revenged upon that white thief who loves you, for he shall live to see you the wife of another man, a wild man. And have you never thought, Soa, that I may have wishes of my own in this matter? Doubtless, yet the fairest women cannot always have what they may chance to wish. No, Shepherdess, that this must be both for your own sake and for the sake of Nam, my father. Olfen loves you, 
and in these troubled times it is necessary that Nam and the priests should gain his support, which has been bought by now by the promise that you will be given to him in marriage on this very day. For you, Shepherdess, although you might have wished to wed one of your own race, at least you will rule a queen, and that is better than to perish miserably. I think otherwise, Soa, Juanna answered calmly, for she saw that neither passion nor pleading would help her, and of the two I choose to die. And she put her hand to her hair, then started, for she found the poison gone. You will choose to die, Shepherdess, said Soa with a cold smile, but this is not always so easy. I have taken your medicine from you while you slept, and here there are no other means to compass death. I can starve, Soa, replied Juanna with dignity. That takes some time, Shepherdess, and today you will become the wife of Olfen. Still it is needful that you should yourself consent to marry him. For this chief is so foolish that he declares that he will not wed you till you have accepted him with your own mouth and in the presence of witnesses. Then I fear that the wedding will not be celebrated, said Juanna, with a bitter laugh, for she could not refrain from giving some outward expression to all the loathing which she felt for this wicked woman, who in her fierce love would save the life of her mistress by selling her to shame. I think that it will, Shepherdess, answered Soa, for it seems that we have a way by which we can win you to speak those words which often desires to hear. There is no way, Soa. What, none, Shepherdess? Think now. He who you name Deliverer is a prisoner beyond that door. What if his life hangs upon your choice? What if he were shown to you about to die a fearful death from which you alone could save him by speaking a certain word. Now for the first time Juanna fully understood the hideous nature of the plot whereby Soa proposed either to force her to become the wife of a savage or thrust upon her the guilt of causing the death of the man whom she loved. And she sank back upon the couch, saying, You would have done better to leave me yonder in the slave camp, Soa. Then, abandoning the tone of forced calm in which she had spoken hitherto, Soa broke out bitterly. When you were in the slave camp, Shepherdess, you loved me, who have loved you from a child. For then no white dog had come to sow mischief between us and to make you hate and distrust me. Then I would have died for you, I, and this I would do now, but also I would be revenged upon the white dog. For I, who am husbandless and childless, had but this one thing, and he has taken it from me. You were to me as mother and lover and babe are to other women, my all. And now I am left desolate, and I will be revenged upon him before I die. But I still love you, Shepherdess, and could any other plan have been found to help you, I could not have forced this marriage on you. No such plan can be found. Thus alone you can live and become great and happy. And thus alone can I continue to feast my eyes upon you, though it be from far. She ceased, trembling with the strength of the passion that shook her, to which indeed her words had given but feeble expression. Go, said Juanna. I would have time to think. Then Nam spoke again. We go, Shepherdess, in obedience to your wish. But before evening we shall return to hear your answer. Do not attempt to work mischief upon yourself, for know that you will be watched, though you cannot see the eyes that watch you. If you do, but so much as lift a hand against your life, or even strive to cut off the light that flows through yonder hole, then at once you will be seized and bound, and my daughter will be set to guard you. Shepherdess, farewell. And they went, leaving Juana alone, and a prey to such thoughts as can scarcely be written. For several hours she sat there upon the couch, allowing no hint of what she felt to appear upon her face, 
for she was too proud to suffer the eyes which she knew were spying on her, though whence she could not tell, to read her secret anguish. As she sat thus in her utter desolation, several things grew clear to Juanna, and the first of them was that Soa must be mad. The love and hate that seethed in her fierce heart had tainted her brain, making her more relentless than a leopard robbed of its young. From the beginning she had detested Leonard and had been jealous of him, and incautiously enough he had always shown his dislike and distrust of her. By slow degrees these feelings had hardened into insanity, and to gratify the vile promptings of her disordered mind she would hesitate at nothing. From Soa, therefore, she could hope for no relenting. Nor had she better prospect with Nam, for it was evident that in his case political considerations operated as strongly as did those of a personal character with his daughter. He was so much involved, he had committed himself so deeply in this matter of the false gods, that rightly or wrongly he conceived so as planned to offer the only feasible chance of escape from the religious complications by which he was surrounded, that threatened to bring his life and power to a simultaneous end. It was out of the question, therefore, to expect help from the high priest, who was in the position of a man on a runaway horse with precipices on either side of him, unless, indeed, she could show him some safer path. Failing this, it would avail her nothing that he hated and feared often, and only promoted this marriage in order to bribe the king into standing his friend during the expected political convulsions. Indeed, as she guessed rightly, Nam would much better like to know her safely over the borders of the mist land than to be called upon to greet her as its queen. This was obvious seeing that, should she return to power, religious or temporal, it was scarcely to be hoped that she would forget the wrongs which she had suffered at his hands. The marriage was merely a temporal expedient designed to ward off immediate evil, but should it come about and the crisis be tided over, it was plain that the struggle between the false goddess and the perjured priest must be carried on until it ended in the death of one or both of them. However, all these things lay in the future, as Nam foretold it, a future which Juana never meant to live to see. There remained Leonard and Olfen. The former, of course, was powerless, at least for the present, having suffered himself to be entrapped, though his lack of caution mattered little, for doubtless if Guile had failed, force would have been employed. It was she who must save Leonard, for he could do nothing to save her. The more Juana thought of the matter, the more she became convinced that her only hope lay in Olfen himself, who had sworn friendship to her, and who certainly was no traitor. She remembered that in their conversation of the day before, he had admitted that she could be nothing to him while Leonard lived. Probably Nam had told her that the Deliverer was dead. And then it was actuated by his passion, which she knew to be genuine enough, that he had entered into a bargain with the priest. These must be the terms of the compact, the game of the false gods being played. Olfen undertook to support Nam and the rest of his party to the best of his power, for the consideration to be received of her hand in marriage stipulating, however, that she should give it of her own free will. This, of course, she would never do, therefore Olfen's proviso gave her a loophole of escape, though Juana was well aware that it would not be wise to rely too implicitly on the generosity of the savage chief in matters upon which savages are apt to be neither generous nor delicate. On this she must fall back as a last resource, or rather as a last resource but one. Meanwhile, she would fight Nam and Soa, step by step. 
yielding only when she saw that further obstinacy on her part would involve Leonard's destruction. It was possible, indeed, it was probable, that everything might fail her, and in that event she must not fail herself. In other words, although the poison had been taken from her, she must find a means of death. Having thought these problems out so far as it was in her power to do, Juana rose and began to walk up and down the cell, noting its construction and peculiarities. Doubtless Leonard was behind yonder door, but it was so thick that she could hear nothing of his movements. For the rest it seemed clear that escape was impossible. Excepting the door, the shaft in the rock was the only other opening that she was able to see. But through this no child could pass, and if he might, it would be to fall into the pool of raging water. Had Otter lived through that fight with the snake god, she wondered. There was small chance of it, but at least he had made an end worthy of his reputation, and she felt proud of him. And the other, Francisco, of him also, she was proud indeed, but for herself she was ashamed, for she knew that she had been the blame, though not designedly. Who would have guessed that this frail, timid man could prove himself such a hero, or who could estimate the power of the unsought and unhappy love which enabled him to conquer the fear of death? She had been wrong to be angry with Leonard, for she knew well that, if it could have been so, he would gladly have given his own life for hers. Alas, it seemed that she was always wrong, for her temper was quick, and the tongue is an unruly member. They had both of them been ready to die for her, and one of them had done so. Well, now it was probable that the tables would be turned before many hours were over, and that she would be called upon to offer herself to save her lover. If this came about, she would not forget the example of Francisco, but would rather try to equal it in the heroism of her end. The day passed slowly, and at length the gloom gathering in the little cell told her that night was near. Before it fell, however, Soa and Nam entered, bearing candles, which they fixed upon brackets in the walls. We come, shepherdess, to hear your answer, said Nam. Will you consent to take Olfen for a husband, or will you not? I will not consent. Think again, shepherdess. I have thought you have my answer. At the words, Nam seized her arm, saying, Come hither, shepherdess. I would show you something. And he led her to that door in passing which Leonard had been entrapped and at the same time Soa extinguished one of the candles, taking the other in her hand as she left the cell, bolting the door behind her so that Nam and Juana stood in darkness. Shepherdess, said Nam sternly, you are about to see him whom you named the Deliverer. Now remember this, if you cry out or speak above a whisper, he dies. Juana made no answer although she felt her heart grow faint within her. Five minutes or more passed, and of a sudden a panel slid back in the upper part of the door, which connected the two cells, so that Juana could see through it, although those who stood on the further side could not see her, for they were in light and she was in darkness. And this is what she saw. Ranged against the wall of the second prison, and opposite to her were three priests holding candles in their hands, whereof the light shone upon their sullen, cruel faces and the snake's head tattooed on their naked breasts. In front of these men stood two other priests, and between them was Leonard, bound and gagged. On the hither side of the cell, and not more than two feet from the open panel, stood Soa, on whom the eyes of the executioners were fixed, as though awaiting a command. Between Soa and these men yawned an open hole in the rock floor. When Juana had gazed upon this scene for some twenty seconds, 
the sliding panel was closed, apparently by Soa, and Nam spoke. You have seen, Shepherdess, he said, that the Deliverer is bound, and you have seen also that before him is a hole in the floor of the prison. He who falls down that hole, Shepherdess, finds himself in the den of the snake beneath, from the visiting of whom no man has ever returned alive, for it is through it that we feed the water-dweller at certain seasons of the year, and when there is no sacrifice. Now, Shepherdess, you must choose between two things, either to wed often of your own free will this night, or see the Deliverer thrown to the snake before your eyes, and afterwards to wed often, whether you will it or not. What do you say, Shepherdess? Juana took counsel with herself, and came to the conclusion that she would resist a little longer, for she thought that this scene might have been planned merely to try her fortitude. I refuse to marry Olfen, she answered. Then Nam opened the panel and whispered a word into the ear of Soa, who uttered a command. Instantly the two executioner priests flung Leonard onto his back upon the ground, an easy task seeing that his legs were fastened with ropes, and dragged him forward until his head hung over the oubliette-like hole. Then they paused, as though waiting for some further order. Nam drew Juana some few paces away from the door. "'What is your word now, shepherdess?' he said. "'Is the man to die or be saved? Speak swiftly.' Juana glanced through the opening and saw that now Leonard's head and shoulders had vanished down the oubliette, while one of the priests held him by the ankles, watching Soa for the sign to let him fall. Loose him, said Juana faintly. I will marry Olfen. Stepping forward, Nan whispered to Soa, who issued another order. Thereupon the priests drew Leonard from his perilous position, and unwillingly enough, rolled him to the side of the cell, for they would have preferred to be rid of him. At that moment also the shutter was closed. I said, loose him, repeated Juana, now that the man lies unable to move like a fallen tree on the ground. No, shepherdess, replied Nam, perchance you may yet change your mind, and then it would be troublesome to bind him afresh, for he is very strong and violent. Listen, Shepherdess, when Olfen comes presently to ask your hand, you must say nothing of that man yonder, for he deems him to be dead, and the moment you speak of him, he will be dead. Do you understand? I understand, answered Juana, but at least the gag might be taken from his mouth. Fear not, Shepherdess, it shall be done, when you have spoken with Olfen, and now, at what hour, Will it be your pleasure to see him? When you will. The sooner it is finished, the better. Good. My daughter, he added to Soa, who had just then entered the cell. Be pleased to make fire, and then summon the king Olfen, who waits without. Soa departed upon her errand, and overcome with terror, which she would not show, Juana sank upon the couch hiding her face in her hands. For a while there was silence. Then the door opened again, and, heralded by Soa, Olfen, the king, stood before her. "'Be careful, shepherdess,' whispered Dom as they entered. "'One word, and the deliverer dies.'" End of chapter 34《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハ The king was accustomed to hide his thoughts. He leaned on the shaft of his broad spear, 
his head bowed slightly as though in humility, his dark eyes fixed upon her face, immovable, impassive, a picture of savage dignity. Indeed, Juana was fain to confess to herself that she had never seen a grander specimen of the natural man than that presented by the chief of the people of the mist, as he stood before her in her rock prison. The light of the candles fell full upon him, revealing his great girth and stature, besides which those of the finest men of her own race would have seemed insignificant. It shone upon the ivory torques, emblems of royalty, which were about his neck, wrist, and ankles, upon the glossy garments of black goatskin that hung from his shoulders and middle, and the raven tresses of his hair bound back from his forehead by a narrow band of white linen, which showed in striking contrast against the clear olive coloring of his face and breast. Speak, Olfen, said Juanna at length. It was told to me, Queen, he answered in a low, full voice, that you had words to say to me. Nevertheless, now as always, I obey you. Queen, I learned that your husband, he whom you loved, is dead, and believe me, I sorrow for you. In this shameful deed I had no hand, that together with the end of the other white man and the dwarf, must be set down to the account of the priest, who swears that he was driven to it by the clamor of the people. Queen, they have all gone across the mountains and through the sky beyond, and you, like some weary dove, far traveled from a southern clime, are left to prey among the eagles of the people of the mist. But a few hours since I thought you dead also, for with all the thousands in the temple, I believed that it was your fair body which Nam hurled at dawn from the brow of the statue. And I tell you that when I saw it, I, who am a warrior, wept and cursed myself, because although I was a king, I had no power to save you. Afterwards this man, the high priest, came to me, telling me the truth and a plan that he had made for his own ends, whereby you might be saved alive and lifted up among the people, and he also might be saved, and my rule be made sure in the land. And he ceased. What is the plan, Olfen? asked Juana after a pause. Queen, it is that you should wed me and appear before the people no longer as a goddess, but as a woman who has put on the flesh for her love's sake. I know well that I am all unworthy of such honor, moreover, that your heart must be sore with the loss of one who was dear to you, and little set upon the finding of another husband. Also I remember certain words that passed between us, as a promise which I made. All these things I told to Nam, and he answered me, saying that the matter was urgent, that here you could not be hid away for long and that if I did not take you to wife, then you must die. Therefore, because my love towards you is great, I said to him, Go now and ask her if she will smile upon me, if I come before her with such words. Nam went, but before he went, he made certain agreements with me on matters of policy under which I must pay a heavy price for you. Lady, and forego revenge, and forget many an ancient hate, all of which things I have promised to do, should you smile upon me, so great is my love towards you. The hours went by, and Nam came back to me, saying that, having weighed the matter in your mind, your answer was favorable. To this I replied that I did not trust him, and would take it from your lips alone. And now, Queen, I am here, to listen to your word, and to offer myself to you, to serve you all my life as your husband and your slave. I have little to give you who have been bred up in sunnier lands, and among a more gentle people, I who am but the wild chief of men, whose hearts are rugged as our mountains, and gloomy as a winter's day, 
that is heavy with snow to come. Only myself, the service of my soldier spears, and the first place among the children of the mist. Now let me hear your answer, and be what it may, I will accept it without a murmur. For least of all things do I desire to force myself upon you in marriage. Still I pray you, speak to me plainly once and for all. For if I must lose you, I would know the worst. Nor I can bear, when you have smiled upon me, to see you turn away. Nay, I would sooner die. And once more he bowed his head, leaned upon his spear, and was silent. Juanna considered the position rapidly. It was hopeless and cruel. Nam and Soa were on either side of her, the latter standing near the door with the sliding panel beyond which Leonard lay bound, and she knew well that did she speak a single word of the truth to Olfen, it would be the signal for her lover's death. It was possible that the king might be able to protect her own person from violence. But if Leonard died, it mattered little what became of her. There was but one thing that she could do, declare herself willing to become the wife of Olfen. Yet it seemed shameless thus to treat this honorable man, the only friend that they had found among the people of the mist. But of truth, such necessity as hers cannot wait while those in their toils weigh scruples or the law of honor. Olfen, she said, I have heard you, and this is my answer. I will take you as my husband. You know my story. You know that he who was my lord is but this day dead. Here Soa smiled approvingly at the lie, and that I loved him. Therefore, of your gentleness, you will accord me some few weeks before I pass from him to you, in which I may mourn my widowhood. I will say no more, but surely you can guess the sorrow of my heart and all that I have left unsaid. It shall be as you wish, Queen, replied Olfen, taking her hand and kissing it, while his somber face grew radiant with happiness. You shall pass into my keeping at that time which best pleases you, yet I fear that in one matter you must be troubled now, this very hour. What may that be, Olfen? asked Juanna anxiously. Only this, Queen, that the rite of marriage, as we practice it, must be celebrated between us. It is necessary for many reasons, which will be made clear to you tomorrow. Moreover, such was my bargain with Nam, sealed by an oath sworn upon the blood of Aka, an oath that I do not dare to break. Oh, no, no, said Juanna, in acute distress. Think, Olfen, how can I, whose husband is not six hours dead, vow myself to another man upon the altar of his grave? Give me some few days, I pray you. Most willingly would I do this, lady, but I may not. It is against my oath. Also, what can it matter? You shall remain alone for as long as it shall please you. Then Nam spoke for the first time, saying, Shepherdess, waste no breath in words, for learn that though this garment of modesty is becoming to one newly widowed, yet you must put it from you. More depends upon this ceremony than you know of. The lives of many hang upon it, our own perchance among them, and especially the life of one whom it does not become me to speak. And as though by accident, Nam let his eyes rest upon the door of the adjoining cell. Of his auditors often thought that he was alluding to his own life, but Juanna and his daughter knew well that he spoke of that of Leonard, which would be sacrificed did the former persist in her objections to the instant celebration of the marriage. You hear his words, Queen, said Olfen, and there is weight in them. The times are very dangerous, and if our plot is to be carried through, before midnight I must make an oath to the captains and the council of the elders, that you have come back from death to be my wife. Maybe, answered Juanna, catching at a straw in her despair, but must I, 
who shall be set over this people as queen, be married thus in secret? Or at the least I will have witnesses. Let some of the captains whom you trust, Olfen, be brought here to see us wed. Otherwise the time may come when I shall be held to be no true wife, and there are none to establish my honor by their words. There is little to fear of such a thing, Queen, answered Olfen, with a faint smile. Yet your demands are just. I will bring three of my captains here, men who will not betray us, and they shall be witness to this rite. And he turned as though he would go to seek them. Do not leave me, said Juanna, catching him by the wrist. I trust you, but these two I do not trust. I fear to be left alone. There is no need for witnesses, exclaimed Nam in a threatening voice. The shepherdess has asked for witnesses, and she shall have them, answered Olfen fiercely. Old man, you have played with me long enough. Hitherto I have been your servant. Now I will be your master. Some hours ago your life was forfeit to me, for the white dawn had turned to red, and I meant to take it. But you bribed me with this bait and he pointed to Juanna. Nay, do not lay your hand upon your knife. You forget I have my spear. Your priests are without. I know it, but so are my captains, and I have told them where I am. If I vanish, as many vanish here, my life will be required at your hands, for Nam, your power is broken. Now obey me. Bid that woman summon him who guards without. No, you do not stir, and he lifted the spear till its keen blue point quivered over the high priest's naked breast. Bid her to go to the door and summon the guard. I said to the door, but not beyond it, or beware. Nam was cowed. His tool had become his master. Obey, said the Soa. Obey, but no more, echoed Ofen. Snarling like a wolf, the woman slipped past them to the door, and opening it a little way, she whistled through the crack. Hide yourself, lady, said Olfen. Juana retreated into the shadow behind the candle, and at that moment a voice spoke through the door, saying, I am here, father. Now speak, said Olfen, advancing the spear an inch nearer Nam's heart. My son, said the priest, Go to the entrance by which the king entered, where you will find three captains, generals of the king. Lead them hither. And see that you speak to no one on the way, whispered Olfen, in Nam's ear. And see that you speak to no one on the way, repeated Nam. I hear you, father, replied the priest, and went. Some ten minutes passed, and the door opened again. The captains are here, whispered a voice. Let them enter, said Nam. The order was obeyed, and three great men, armed with spears, stalked into the narrow chamber. One of them was the brother to the king, and the two others were his chosen friends. Then the door closed. My brethren, said Olfen, I have sent for you to acquaint you with a mystery, and to ask you to witness a rite. The goddess Akka, who this day was hurled into the pool of the snake, has returned to earth as a woman, and is about to become my wife. Here the captain started. Nay, brethren, ask no questions. These things are so. It is enough. Now, priest, play your part. After that, for a while, all seemed a dream to Juanna, a dream of which she was never able to recover any exact memory. She could recollect standing side by side with Olfen, while Nam muttered prayers and invocations over them, administering to them terrible oaths which they took, calling upon the names of Akka and Yal, and swearing by the symbol of the snake. Beyond that, everything went blank. Indeed, her mind flew back to another marriage ceremony, where she stood beside Leonard in the slave camp, and the priest Francisco prayed over them and blessed them. It was that scene which she saw, and not the one enacting before her eyes, and with its visions were mixed up strange impersonal reflections on the irony of fate, which had brought it about 
that she should figure as the chief actor in two such dramas, the first of which Leonard had gone through to save her, and the second of which she must go through to save him. At last it was done, and once more Olfen was bowing before her and kissing her hand. Greetings, shepherdess, hail queen of the people of the mist, he said, and the captains repeated his words. Juana awoke from her stupor. What was to be done now, she wondered. What could be done? Everything seemed lost. Then, of a sudden, an inspiration took her. It is true that I am queen, is it not, Olfen? It is true, lady. And as queen of the people of the mist, I have power, have I not, Olfen? Even to life and death, he answered gravely, though if you kill, you must answer to the council of elders and to me. All in this land are your servants, lady, and none dare to disobey you, except on matters of religion. Good, said Juana. Then addressing the captains in a tone of command, she added, Seize the priest who is named Nam, and the woman with him. Olfen looked astonished, and the captains hesitated. As for Nam, he did not hesitate, but made a bound towards the door. Stay a while, Nam, said the king, making a barrier before him with his spear. Doubtless the queen has reasons, and you would wish to hear them. Hold them, my captains, since the queen commands it. The three men sprang upon them. Once Nam tried to draw his knife, but failing in his attempt, he submitted without further struggle. With Soa it was different. She bit and tore like a wildcat, and Juana saw that she was striving to reach the panel and to speak through it. On your lives, do not suffer her to come to that door, she said. Presently you shall know why. Then the brother of the king dragged Soa to the couch, and throwing her down upon it, stood over her, his spear-point at her throat. Now, queen, said Ophan, your will is done, and perhaps it may please you to explain. Listen, king, and listen, you captains, she answered. These liars told you that the deliverer was dead. Was it not so? He is not dead. He lies bound in yonder cell. But had I spoken a word to you, then he would have died. Olfen, do you know how my consent was won to be your wife? A shutter within that door was opened, and he, my husband, was shown to me, gagged and bound, and being held over the mouth of a hideous pit in the floor of his prison, that leads I know not whither. Consent or he dies, they said, and for my love's sake I consented. This was the plot, often, to marry me to you, partly because the woman yonder, who was my nurse, did not desire my death, and partly that Nam might use me to save himself from the anger of the people. But do not think that you would have kept me long, often, for this was in the plot also, that when you had served their purpose, you should die by secret means, as one who knew too much." It is a lie, said Nam. Silence, answered Juana. Let that door be opened, and you shall see if I have lied. Wait a while, queen, said Ophan, who appeared utterly overcome. If I understand you right, your husband lives, and therefore you say that the words which we have spoken and the oaths that we have sworn mean nothing, for you are not my wife. That is so, Ophan. Then now I am minded to turn wicked and let him die, said the king slowly, for know this, lady, I cannot give you up. Juana grew pale as death, understanding that this man's passion, now that once he had given them way, had passed beyond his control. I cannot give you up, he repeated. Have I not dealt well with you? Did I not say to you, consent or refuse, as it shall please you? But having once consented, you must not go back upon your words. What have I to do with the reasons that prompted them? My heart heard them and believed them. Queen, you are wed to me. Those oaths that you have sworn may not be broken. It is too late. Now you are mine, nor can I suffer you to pass from me back to another man, even though 
He was your husband before me. But the deliverer, must I then become my husband's murderer? Nay, I will protect him, and, if it may be, find means to send him from the land. Juana stood silent and despairing, and at this moment Soa, lying on the couch, broke into a shrill and mocking laugh that stung her like a whip and roused her from her lethargy. King, she said, I am at your mercy, not through any wanton folly of my own, but because fate has made a sport of me. King, you have been hardly used, and, as you say, hitherto you have dealt well with me. Now I pray you let the end be as the beginning was, so that I may always think of you as the noblest among men, except one who died this day to save me. King, you say you love me. Tell me, then, if my life hung upon a word of yours, would that word remain unspoken? Such was my case. I spoke the word, and for one short hour I betrayed you. Will you, whose heart is great, bind me by such an oath as this, an oath wrung from me to save my darling? from the power of those dogs. If this is so, then I have erred strangely in my reading of your mind, for till now I have held you to be a man who would perish ere he fell so low as to force a helpless woman to be his wife, one whose crime is that she deceived him to save her husband. She paused, and clasping her hands as though in prayer, looked up into his troubled face with beseeching eyes. Then, as he did not speak, she went on. King, I have one more word to say. You are the strongest, and you can take me, but you cannot hold me, for that hour would be my last, and you, but the richer, by your broken honor and a dead bride. Olfen was about to answer when Soa, fearing lest Juana's pleading should prevail, against his passion, broke in, saying, Be not fooled, king, by a woman's pretty speeches, or by her idle threats that she will kill herself. She will not kill herself. I know her well. She loves her life too much, and soon, when you are wed, she will love you also, for it is the nature of us women to worship those who master us. Moreover, that man, the deliverer, is not her husband, except in name. For months I have lived with them, and I know it. Take her, king, take her now, this hour, or live to mourn her loss and your folly all your life's days. I will not answer that slave's falsehood, said Juana, drawing herself up and speaking proudly. And it were more worthy of you not to listen to them, king. I have spoken, now do your will. Be great or little, be noble or be base, as your nature teaches you. And suddenly she sank to the ground, and shaking her long hair about her face and arms, she burst into bitter weeping. Twice the king glanced at her, then he turned his head, as though he dare look no more, and spoke, keeping his eyes fixed upon the wall. Rise, queen, he said hoarsely and cease your tears, since you are safe from me. Now, as always, I live to do your will. But I pray you, hide your face from me as much as may be, for, lady, my heart is broken with love for you, and I cannot bear to look on that which I have lost. Still sobbing, but filled with admiration and wonder that a savage could be thus generous, Juan arose and began to murmur thanks, while the captain stared and so a mocked and cursed them both. Thank me not, he said gently. It seems that you, who can read all hearts, have read mine aright, or perchance you fashioned it as you would have it be. Now, having done with love, let us to war. Woman, what is the secret of that door? Find it for yourself, snarled Soa. It is easy to open when once you know the spring like a woman's heart, Olfen, or if you cannot find it, then it can be forced, like a woman's love, Olfen. Surely you who are so skilled in the winning of a bride need not seek my counsel as to the opening of a door. For when I gave it 
but now, upon the first of these matters, you would not hearken, often, but were melted by the sight of tears that you should have kissed away. Juana heard, and from that moment made up her mind, that whatever happened she had done with Soa. Nor was this wonderful, for few women could have pardoned what she had suffered at her hands. Drive the spear into her till she speaks, comrade, said Olfen. Then, at the touch of steel, Soa gave up mocking and told the secret of the door. End of chapter 35「Chapter thirty six of the People of the Mist by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How Otter came back after he had rested a while at the bottom of the glacier. Otter set to work to explore the cliff on the top of which he found himself with the view of descending it and hiding at its foot till nightfall when he hoped to find means of re-entering the city and putting himself in communication with Olfen. Very soon, however, he discovered that if he was to return at all, he must follow the same route by which he had come. Evidently, the tunnel sloped upward very sharply, for he was standing on the brow of a precipice cut in the three slopes, which, taken together, may have measured some three hundred feet in height, and so far as he could see, it was utterly impossible to descend any of these cliffs without the aid of ropes, nor could he continue his investigations over a wide area. For about four hundred paces to the left of the opening to the subterranean passage, whereof, by the way, he was very careful to note the exact position, the mountain pushed out a snowy shoulder, with declivities so precipitous that he dared not trust himself on them. Then he tried the right-hand side, but with no better luck, for here he was stopped by a yawning rift in the rock. Now Otter sat down and considered the situation. The day was still young, and he knew that it would be foolish to attempt escape from the pool before dark. In front of him, the mountain rose steeply till, so far as he could judge, it reached a pass, which lay some two miles off, at the base of that main peak, on whose snows the priest had watched the breaking of the dawn. Part of this declivity was covered with blocks of green ice, but here and there appeared patches of earth, on which grew stunted trees, shrubs, and even grass and flowers. Being very hungry, it occurred to Otter that he might find edible roots among this scanty vegetation. With this hope, he began to climb the slope to be rewarded in due course by the discovery of a vegetable that he recognized. For it was the same which had been offered to him on the occasion of his unlucky outbreak that had resulted in the casting away of the rubies. With this poor food, the dwarf filled himself, and having found a bough that made him an excellent staff, he continued his climb, desiring to see what there might be on the other side of the neck. Arriving there without any great difficulty, Otter stood astonished. Although he was not much given to the study of scenery, below him lay the City of the Mist, with its shining belt of rivers that, fed from the inexhaustible mountain snows, meandered across the vast plains, now no longer hidden in mist, which they had trodden on their journey. Above his head the mighty peak towered thousands of feet into the air till it ended in a summit shaped like a human finger pointing eternally to the heavens. Before him the scene was even stranger, made up as it was, of snowy fields, broken by ridges of black rock, and laid one beneath the other, like white sails drying upon the slopes of a sand hill. Gradually, as the eye traveled downward, these snow fields grew fewer and fewer, till at last they vanished altogether and their place was taken first by stretches of grassland and finally at the foot of the mountain, but what seemed to be a rich and level country interspersed with clumps of bush and forest trees. 
The first of these patches of snow lay within five furlongs of where the dwarf stood, but several hundred feet below him. Between the neck of the pass and the snow stretched a mighty rift or chasm, with sides so sheer that no goat could have kept the footing on them. Yet this gulf was not without its bridge, for a rock wall rose from the bottom of the chasm, forming the bed of a glacier, which spanned it from side to side. In some places the wall was comparatively level, and in others it showed descents sharp as those of a waterfall. This remarkable bridge of ice that varied from a hundred paces to a few yards in width was bordered on either side by the most fearful precipices, while just where its fall was sheerest and its width narrowest, it seemed to spring across a space of nothingness, like the arch of a bridge thrown from bank to bank of a river. Indeed, at this point, its line became so attenuated that in the glittering sunlight Otter was doubtful whether it was not broken through for a distance of some yards. Being of an inquiring mind, the dwarf decided to satisfy himself upon the matter. All around him lay slabs of rock, some of which were worn perfectly smooth and to the thinness of a tombstone by centuries of polishing in the iron jaws of glaciers. Selecting one of these of convenient size, Otter approached the edge of the bridge, pushing the stone before him over the frozen snow. Here the ice was perfect, except for a slight hoar-frost that covered it, for the action of the wind prevented the snow from gathering on the bridge, and whenever the sun was strong enough to melt its surface, it froze again at night, so that no slide upon a parish pond could have been more slippery or free from inequalities. Otter gave his stone a push, and away it went, sometimes swiftly and sometimes at a trifling speed, according to the nature of the angle down which it passed, leaving a bright green ribbon upon the ice in its wake, whence it swept the hoarfrost as it sped. Once or twice he thought that it was going to stop, but it never did stop. At length, it approached the steepest and narrowest part of the descent, down which the stone rushed with fearful velocity. Now I shall see whether the bridge is broken, thought Otter, and just then the rock, traveling like an arrow, came to that portion of the glacier where, for a width difficult to estimate, it stretched unsupported over space and measured only some feet across. On it flew, then seemed to leap into the air and once more sped forward till it reached the further slope of snow, up which it traveled for a distance and stopped, appearing, even to Otter's keen sight, no larger than a midge upon a tablecloth. Now if a man had been seated on that stone, he might have passed this bridge in safety, said Otter to himself, yet it is one that few would care to travel, unless sure death were behind him. Then he determined on a second trial, and selecting another and somewhat lighter stone, he sent it upon its journey. It followed precisely the same course as its predecessor, but when it came to the knife blade of the bridge it vanished. I am sorry for that stone, thought Otter, for doubtless it, that has been whole for many years, is at this moment only little pieces. A third time he repeated his experiment choosing the heaviest rock that he could move. This messenger also leaped into the air at the narrowest portion of the bridge, then passed on in safety to the slope of snow beyond. A strange place, thought Otter, and I pray that it may never be my lot to ride one of those stone horses. Then he turned down the mountain again, for the afternoon was advancing. When he reached the entrance to the riverbed, Sunset was at hand. For a while he sat watching the fading light and eating some more roots which he had gathered. Now he crawled into the passage and commenced his darksome journey towards the home of the dead water-dweller, though what he was to do when he got there he did not know. No accident befell him, and in due course he arrived safely in the den, 
his journey being much facilitated by the staff he bore, which enabled him to feel his way like a blind man. Creeping to the edge of the pool, he listened to its turmoil, for the shadows were gathering so fast, with some ghost-like shapes of foam accepted, he could not even see the surface of the water. If I go in there now, how can I get out again? Otter thought sadly. After all, perhaps, I should have done better to return while it was still light, for then by the help of my staff and the rope I might have made shift to climb the overhanging ledge of rock, but to try this now were madness. I will go back and sit in the cave with the ghosts of the god, and his dead, till morning comes again, though I do not crave their company. So he retreated a few paces, and sat in silence near the tail of the dead crocodile. After a while, a loneliness took hold of him. He tried to sleep, and could not, for it seemed to Otter that he saw eyes staring at him from the depths of the cave, and heard dead men whispering to each other tales of their dreadful ends. Moment by moment his fears grew upon him, for Otter was very superstitious. Now he fancied that he could distinguish the head of the reptile, limbed in fire, and resting on the edge of the rock, as he had seen it that morning. Doubtless, he thought, this monster is a devil, and has come to life again to be revenged upon me. Wow! I liked him better when he was in the flesh than now that he has turned himself to fire. Then to comfort himself, he began to talk aloud, saying, Otter, unlucky that you are, why did you not die at once, instead of living on to be tormented by ghosts? Perhaps your master, the boss, whom alone you love, is dead already, and waits for you to come to serve him. You are very tired. Say now, Otter, would it not be well if you took that rope, which is about your middle, and hanged yourself? Thus you too would become a ghost and be able to do battle with them in their own fashion. And he groaned loudly. Then of a sudden he grew fearful indeed. The short wool stood upon his head, his teeth chattered, and as he said afterwards, his very nose seemed to grow cold with terror. For as he sat, he heard, or seemed to hear, a voice speaking to him from the air, and that voice his master's. Otter, otter, said the voice. He made no answer. He was too frightened. Otter, is that you? whispered the voice again. Then he spoke. Yes, boss, it is I. I know that you are dead, and call me. Give me one minute, till I can undo my rope, and I will kill myself and come to you. Thank you, Otter, said the voice, with a ghastly attempt at a laugh. But if it is all the same, I would much rather that you came alive. Yes, boss and I too would rather stop alive. But being alive, how can I join you who are dead? You fool, I am not dead, said Leonard. Then, boss, how is it that you speak out of the air? Come near to me, that I may touch you and be comforted. I cannot, Otter. I am bound and in a prison above you. There is a hole in the floor, and if you have a rope, as I heard you say, perhaps you could climb up to me. Now the dwarf began to understand. Rising, he stretched the long staff he had brought with him high above his head, and found to his delight that he could touch the roof of the cave. Presently, the point of the staff ceased to press upon the rock. "'Is the place here, boss?' said Otter. "'It is here, but you must throw the stick up like a spear through the hole, for I am tied and cannot put out my hand to take it. Stay a while, boss. First, I must make the line fast to it. Good, but be swift, for I am in danger. Hurriedly, Otter undid the rope from about his middle, knotting it securely to the center of the stick. Then some five feet below the stick, he made a loop large enough for a man to place his foot in. And having ascertained the exact situation of the opening in the roof of the cave, he hurled the staff upwards and jerked at the line. "'It is fixed,' whispered Leonard from above. "'Now come up if you can.' The dwarf required no second invitation. 
Seizing the rope as high as he could reach above his head, he began to drag himself up hand over hand. No easy task, for the hide cord was thin, and cut his fingers and his right leg, round which he had twisted it, to get a better purchase. Presently, however, he succeeded in setting his foot in the loop he had prepared, when he found that his head and shoulders were in the hole, and that, by reaching upwards, he could grasp the staff which lay across it. The rest was easy. Within half a minute, he lay gasping at his master's side. "'Have you a knife, Otter?' "'Yes, boss, my small one. The big ones are down there. I will tell you that story by and by.' "'Never mind the story now, Otter. My hands are tied behind my back. Feel for the lashings and cut them. Then give me the knife that I may free my legs.' Otter obeyed, and presently Leonard rose and stretched himself with a sigh of relief. "'Where's the shepherdess, boss?' "'There in the next cell. They separated me from her, and since then I have been dangled by the legs over that hole, bound and gagged. I think in order to persuade her to consent to something or other by the sight of my danger, for doubtless she was placed where she could see all.' Then they left me, and I managed to spit out the gag, but I could not undo the cords. I expect that they will soon be back again. Then had we better not fly, boss? I have found a passage that leads to the mountains. How can we fly and leave the shepherdess, Otter? Since I have been held down the hole, only two men have visited me from time to time, for they think me helpless. Let us seize these men when they come in, and take their knives, for we are unarmed. Then we can think. Also, we shall have their keys. Yes, boss, we may do that. You take the staff. It is stout. And what will you use? asked Leonard. Fear not, boss. Do these men bear lights? Yes. Then in two minutes I will make me a weapon. And untying the hide rope from the stick, he began to fumble with it busily. "'Now I'm ready, boss,' he said presently. "'Where shall we stand?' "'Here,' answered Leonard, leading him to the door. "'We will crouch in the shadow, one on either side of this door, "'and when the priests have entered and closed it "'and begin to look round for me, "'then we can spring upon them. "'Only, Otter, there must be no bungling and no noise.' "'I think that there will be none, boss.' They will be too frightened to cry at first, and after that they will become dumb. Otter whispered Leonard, as they stood in the dark, Did you kill the water-dweller? Yes, yes, boss, he chuckled in answer. I caught him with the hook that I made ready, but he did not die easily, boss, and if I had not been able to swim well, he would have drowned me. I heard something of it from Nam, said Leonard. You are a wonderful fellow, Otter. Oh, boss, it was no valor of mine. When I saw his eyes, I was horribly afraid. Only I thought how gladly you would have attacked him had you been there. And what a coward you would hold me. Could you have seen me shivering like a girl before a big lizard? And these thoughts gave me courage. Oh, that is all very well, replied Leonard, and suddenly added, Hush, be ready. As he spoke, the door opened, and two great priests came through it, one of them bearing a candle. He who bore the light turned to shut the door, for he suspected nothing. Then at one and the same instant, Leonard, emerging from the shadow, dealt the first priest a blow upon the head with his staff, which stunned, if did not kill him, for he fell like an ox beneath the pole-axe, while Otter, standing where he was, dexterously cast his hide rope about the throat of the second man, and drew the noose tight with a jerk that brought him to the earth. In twenty seconds it was all over. The men who were the same that had held Leonard suspended in the oubliette lay senseless or dead, and the dwarf and his master were engaged in possessing themselves of their knives and keys by the light of the candle, which, though it had fallen to the ground, fortunately remained burning. "'That was well done, Otter,' said Leonard. 
and I am not ashamed to have done it, for these devils kicked me when I was bound. Now we are armed, and have the keys. What next? Just then Otter sprang to his feet, crying, Look out, boss, here are more. Leonard glanced up to see, and behold, the second door in the cell was opened, and through it came Juana, Olfen, Nam, Soa, and three other men. For a moment there was silence, till one of the captains cried out, See, y'all, the god has come back, and already he claims his victims, and he pointed to the two priests. Then followed a scene of confusion, for even Olfen and Nam were amazed at what seemed to them little short of a miracle, while Leonard and Juana had eyes for each other only, and the three captains stared at Otter like men who think they see a ghost. But one person in that company kept her head, and that person was Soa. The captain who guarded her had loosened his hold. Silently, she slunk back into the shadows, and unseen of any, vanished through the doorway by which she had been led in. A minute passed, and Otter, thinking that he heard a noise without that door of the cell, whereby the two priests had entered, which had been left ajar, went to it and tried to open it. Just then, also, Olfen missed Soa. "'Where is the woman, Nam's daughter?' he cried. "'It seems that she has escaped and shut us in, King,' answered Otter calmly. Followed by the others, Olfen sprang first to the door of the cell where they were, and then through the connecting passage to that of Juana's prison. It was true. Both were closed. "'It matters nothing. Here are the keys,' said Leonard." They will not avail us, Deliverer, answered Olfen, for these doors are made fast without by bars of stone thicker than my arm. Now this woman has gone to rouse the college of the priests who will presently come to kill us like caged rats. Quick, said Leonard, waste no time. We must break down the doors. Yes, Deliverer, said Nam mockingly, batter them in with your fists. Cut through the stonework with your spear. Surely they are as nothing to your strength. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 Of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I am repaid, Queen. Their position was terrible. Soa had escaped, and Soa knew everything. Moreover, she was mad with hatred and longing for revenge on Leonard Otter and, in a less degree, on Olfen the king. Had they succeeded in revealing themselves to the people, all might have gone well, for Otter and Juana could certainly have been accepted as true gods who had passed and repassed the gates of death scatheless. But now the affair was different. Soa would tell the truth to the priests who, even if they were inclined to desert her father in his extremity, must strike for their own sakes and for that of their order, which was the most powerful among the people of the mist, and had no desire to be placed under the yoke of secular authority. It was clear to all of them that if they could not escape, they must fall very shortly into the hands of the priests who, knowing everything, would not dare to allow them to appeal to the army or to the superstition of the outside public. The only good card they had was the possession of the person of Nam, though it remained to be seen how far this would help them. To begin with, there was always some ready to step into the shoes of a high priest, and also Nam had blundered so extensively in the matter of the false gods that the greater part of the fraternity, whom he had involved in his mistakes, would not sorrow to see the last of him. These facts, which were perfectly well known to Olfen, and guessed at by his companions, sharpened their sense of danger, in which they had been placed by Zoa's resource and cunning. Indeed, their escape was a matter of life and death to them, and to many hundreds of their adherents. If once they could reach the temple and proclaim the re-arisen gods to the people, all would go well, 
for the army would suffice to keep the priests from using violence. But if they failed in this, their death warrant was already signed, for none of them would ever be heard of again. No wonder, then, that they hurled themselves despairingly upon the stubborn doors. For an hour or more they labored, but all in vain. The massive timbers of hard wood, six inches or more in thickness, could scarcely be touched by their knives and spears, nor might their united strength serve even to stir the stone bolts and bars that held them fast, and they had nothing that could be used as a battering ram. It is useless, said Leonard at last, throwing down his knife in despair. This wood is like iron. It would take us a week to cut through it. Why not try fire, boss? suggested Otter. Accordingly, they attempted to burn down the doors, with the result that they nearly stifled themselves in the smoke and made little impression upon the woodwork. At length they gave up the experiment. It was a failure, and sat looking blankly at each other as they listened to certain sounds which reached them from the passage without, telling them that their enemies were gathering there. "'Has anyone a suggestion to make?' said Leonard at last. "'If not, I think that this game is about played.' "'Boss,' answered Otter, "'I have a word to say. "'We can all go down through the hole by which I came up to you. "'The water-dweller is dead. "'I slew him with my own hand. "'So there is nothing to fear from him. "'Beneath the hole runs a tunnel, "'and that tunnel leads to the slope of the mountain above. At the top of this slope is an ice bridge by which men may reach a fair country if they have a mind to. Then for heaven's sakes let us cross it, put in Juanna. I have seen that bridge, said Olfen, while the captain stared wonderingly at the man whose might had prevailed against the ancient snake. But never yet have I heard of a traveler who dared set his foot upon it. It is dangerous, but it can be crossed, replied Otter. At least, it is better to try it than to stay here to be murdered by these medicine men. I think that we will go, Leonard, said Juanna. If I am to die, I wish to do so in the open air. Only what is to become of Nam, and perhaps Olfen, and the captains would prefer to stop here. Nam will go with us wherever we go, answered Leonard grimly. We have a long score to settle with that gentleman. As for Olfen and his captains, they must please themselves. What will you do, Olfen? asked Juanna, speaking to him for the first time since the scene in the other prison. It seems, Queen, he answered with downcast eyes, that I have sworn to defend you to the last, and this I will do the more readily, because now my life is of little value. As for my brethren here, I think, like you, that they will choose to die in the open, rather than wait to be murdered by the priests. The three captains nodded an assent to his words. Then they all set to work. First they took food and drink, of which there was an ample supply in the other cell, and hurriedly swallowing some of it, disposed the rest about their persons as best they could for they foresaw that even if they succeeded in escaping, it was likely that they would go hungry for many days. Then Leonard wrapped Juanna in a goatskin cloak, which he took from one of the fallen priests, placing the second cloak over his own shoulders, for he knew that it would be bitterly cold on the mountains. Lastly, they tied Nam's arms behind him and deprived him of his knife, so that the old man might work none of them a sudden injury in his rage. All being prepared, Otter made his rope fast to the staff and descended rapidly to the cave below. As his feet touched the ground, the priests began to batter upon the doors of the cell with beams of wood or some such heavy instruments. Quick, Juana, said Leonard, sit in this noose and hold the line. We will let you down. Hurry. Those doors cannot stand for long. Another minute, and she was beside Otter, who stood beneath, a candle in his hand. Then Leonard came down. By the way, Otter, he said, have you seen anything of the jewels that are supposed to be here? 
"'There is a bag yonder by the water-dweller's bed, boss,' answered the dwarf carelessly. "'But I did not trouble to look into it. What is the use of the red stones to us now?' "'None, but they may be of use afterwards if we get away.' "'Yes, boss, if we get away,' answered Otter, bethinking himself of the ice bridge. "'We can pick it up as we go along.' Just then Nam arrived, having been let down by Olfen and the captains, and stood glaring round him, not without awe, for neither he nor any of his brethren had ever dared to visit the sacred home of the snake god. Then the captains descended, and last of all came Olfen. "'We have little time to spare, Deliverer,' said the king. The door is falling, and as he spoke they heard a great crash above. Otter jerked furiously at the rope, till by good luck one end of the stake slid over the edge of the hole and it fell among them. No need to leave this line for them to follow by, he said. Besides, it may be useful. At that moment something appeared looking through the hole. It was the head of one of the pursuing priests. Nam saw it and took his opportunity. The false gods escaped by the tunnel to the mountains, he screamed, and with them the false king. Follow and fear not. The water-dweller is dead. Think not of me, Nam, but slay them. With an exclamation, Otter struck him heavily across the mouth, knocking him backwards. But the mischief was done, for a voice cried in answer, We hear you, father, and will find ropes and follow. Then they started. One moment they paused to look at the huge bulk of the dead crocodile. "'The dwarf is a god in truth,' cried one of the captains, "'for no man could have wrought such a deed.' "'Forward,' said Leonard. "'We have no time to lose.' Now they were by the crocodile's bed among the broken bones of his victims. "'The bag, Otter. Where's the bag?' asked Leonard. "'Here, boss,' answered the dwarf, dragging it from under the moldering skeleton of the unlucky priest who, having offended the new-found god, had been let down through the hole to lay it in its hiding-place and to perish in the jaws of the water-dweller. Leonard took the bag and, opening its mouth, which was drawn tight with a running strip of hide, he peeped into it, while Otter held down the candle that he might see. From its depth came a glimmer of red and blue light that glowed like the heart of some dull fire. "'It is the treasure,' he said, in a low tone of exultation. "'At last the luck has turned.' "'How much does it weigh?' said Juana, as they sped onwards. Seven or eight pounds, I should say,' he answered. "'Still exultantly, seven or eight solid pounds of gems, the finest in the world.' "'Then give it to me,' she said. "'I have nothing else to carry.' You may have to use both of your hands presently. True, he answered, and passed the string of the bag over her head. Now they went on up the smooth, sloping bed of the stream, suffering little inconvenience except from the cold of the water that flowed about their ankles. The stream has risen a little, boss, since I passed it this morning, said Otter. Doubtless the day's sun has melted some snow at its source. Tomorrow we might not have been able to travel this road. Very likely, answered Leonard. I told you that our luck has turned at last. Twenty minutes more, and they reached the mouth of the tunnel, and passing between the blocks of ice, found themselves upon the mountainside. But as it chanced, the face of the moon was hidden by clouds, which is often the case in this country at the beginning of the spring season. For whereas in winter the days are almost invariably misty and the nights clear. In the spring and summer, these atmospheric conditions are frequently reversed. So dark was it indeed that it proved impossible to attempt the ascent of the mountain until the day broke, since to do so would be to run the risk of losing themselves and very possibly breaking their necks among its numerous clefts and precipices. After a minute's hasty discussion, they set to work to fill up the mouth of the tunnel, or rather the cracks between the blocks of ice that already encumbered it. 
with such materials laid a hand, namely lumps of frozen snow, gravel, and a few large stones which they were fortunate enough to find in the immediate vicinity, for the darkness rendered it impossible to search for these at a distance. While they were thus engaged, they heard the voices of the priests speaking on the further side of their somewhat inefficient barrier, and worked harder than ever, thinking that the moment of attack had come. To their astonishment, however, the sound of talking died away. "'Now where have they gone?' said Leonard. "'To climb the cliff by another path and cut us off?' "'I think not, Deliverer,' answered Olfen, "'for I know of no such path. I think that they have gone to bring heavy beams by means of which they will batter down the ice wall. Still there is such a path, King, said one of the captains, for I myself have often climbed it when I was young, searching for snowflowers to bring to her whom I courted in those days. Can you find it now, friend? asked Olfen eagerly. I do not forget a road that I have trod, said the captain, but it is one not easy to follow. See now, shepherdess, said Olfen, after thinking a while, shall we take this man for a guide and return down the cliff to the city? For there, unless fate is against us, we may find friends among the soldiers and fight out this battle with the priests. No, no, answered Juana, almost passionately. I would rather die than go back to that dreadful place to be murdered at last. Do you go, if you will, Olfen? and leave us to take our chance. That I cannot do, Queen, for I am sworn to a certain service, he said proudly. But hearken, my friend, follow this path of which you speak. If you can do so in the darkness and find help, then return swiftly to this spot, where I and your two comrades will hold the priests at bay. Perchance you will not find us living, but this I charge you. If we are dead, give it out, that the gods have left the land because they were so evilly dealt with, and rouse up the people to fall upon the priests and make an end of them once and forever, for thus only shall they win peace and safety. Making no reply, the man shook Olfen and the other two captains by the hand, saluted Juana, and vanished into the dark. Then they all sat down in front of the mouth of the tunnel to wait and watch and very glad were they of the goatskin cloaks which had belonged to the priests. For as the night drew towards the dawn, the cold became so bitter that they could scarcely bear it, but were obliged to rise and stamp to and fro to keep their wet feet from freezing. Leonard said, Juana, you do not know what passed after Nam trapped you. And she told him all the tale. When she had finished, he rose, and taking Olfen by the hand, said, King, I thank you. May fortune deal as well with you as you have dealt by me and mine. Say no more, Deliverer, answered Olfen hastily. I have but done my duty and fulfilled my oath, though at times the path of duty is hard for a man to follow. And he looked toward Juana and sighed. Leonard sat down and was silent. But many a time, both then and in after days, did he wonder at the nobleness of mind of this savage king, which enabled him, under circumstances so cruel, to conquer his own passion and show himself willing to lay down his life and throne together. That he might carry out his vow to protect the woman who had brought him so much pain and now left him forever with his successful rival. At length, Looking at the mountain peak above them, they saw its snows begin to blush red with the coming of the dawn, and just then also they heard many voices talking within the tunnel, and caught glimpses of light flashing through the openings in their rude fortifications. The priests, who no doubt had been delayed by the procuring of the timbers, which were to serve as battering rams, and the labor necessary to drag them up the steep incline of the tunnel, had returned and in force. A few more minutes and a succession of dull thuds on the farther side of the ice wall told the little band of defenders that their enemies were at work. 
The light grows quickly, Deliverer, said Olfen quietly. I think that now you may begin to ascend the mountain and take no harm. What shall we do with this man? asked Leonard, pointing to Nam. Kill him, said Otter. No, not yet a while, answered Olfen. Take this. And he handed Leonard the spear of the third captain, who had left it when he started down the mountain, fearing that it might encumber him and drive him along with you at its point. Should we be overpowered, you may buy your lives as the price of his. But should we hold them back and you escape, then do with him what you will. I know well what I would do with him, muttered Otter, glowering at the priest. And now farewell, went on Olfen, in the same calm voice. Bring more ice, comrades, or stone, if you see any. The walls cracked. Leonard and Otter wrung the king's hand in silence, but Juanna could not leave him thus, for her heart was melted at the thought of all his goodness. Forgive me, she murmured, that I have brought you grief, and, as I fear, death to follow grief. The grief you could not help, queen, and be sure I shall welcome death if he should choose me. Go now, and happiness go with you. May you escape in safety and with the bright pebbles which you desire. May you and your husband, the Deliverer, be blessed for many years in each other's love. And when you grow old together from time to time, think kindly of that wild man who worshipped you while you were young and laid down his life to save you. Juana listened, and tears sprang to her eyes. Then of a sudden she seized the great man's hand and kissed it. I am repaid, queen, he said, and perchance your husband will not be jealous. Now go, and swiftly. As he spoke, a small portion of the wall fell outwards, and the fierce face of a priest appeared at the opening. With a shout, Olfen lifted his broad spear and thrust. The priest fell backwards, and just then the captains arrived with stones and stopped the hole. Then the three turned and fled up the mountainside, Otter driving Nam before him with blows and curses, till at length the old man fell and lay on his face groaning. Nor could the dwarf's blows, which were not of the softest, force him to rise. "'Get up, you treacherous dog,' said Leonard, threatening him with the spear. "'Then you must loose my arms, deliverer,' answered the priest. "'I am very weak.' and I cannot travel up this mountain with my hands bound behind me. Surely you have nothing to fear from one aged and unarmed man. Not much at present, I suppose, muttered Leonard, though we have had enough to fear from you in the past. And taking his knife, he cut loose the lashings. While he did so, Juana turned and looked behind her. Far below them, she could see the forms of Olfen and his companions standing shoulder to shoulder, and even catch the gleam of light reflected from their spears, for now the sun was rising. Beneath them again she saw the grass-grown roofs of that earthly hell, the city of the people of the mist, and the endless plain beyond, through which the river wandered like a silver serpent. There also was the further portion of the huge wall of the temple, built by unknown hands in forgotten years, and rising above the edge of that gap in the cliff through which she was looking, appeared a black mass which she knew to be the head and shoulders of the hideous colossus, on whose dizzy brow she had sat in that strange hour when the shouting thousands thundered a welcome to her as their goddess, and whence her most beloved friend, Francisco, had been hurled to his cruel death. Oh, what I have suffered in that place, she thought to herself. How have I lived through it, I wonder, and yet I have won something. And she glanced at Leonard, who was driving Nam towards her. And if only we survive, and I am the means of enabling him to fulfill his vow and buy back his home with these jewels, I shall not regret all that I have endured to win them. Yes, even when he is no longer so very much in love, he must always be grateful to me, for few women would have done as much for their husbands. Then Nam staggered past, hissing curses, 
while the untiring otter rained blows upon his back. And losing sight of Olfan and his companions, they went on in safety till they reached the neck and saw the ice bridge glittering before them and the wide fields of snow beyond. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Triumph of Nam. Which way are do we go now? said Juana. Must we climb down this great gulf? No, Shepherdess, answered Otter. See, before you is a bridge. And he pointed to the band of ice and rock which traversed the wide ravine. A bridge? gasped Juana. Why, it is as slippery as a slide, and steep as the side of a house. A fly could not keep its footing on it. Look here, Otter, put in Leonard. Either you are joking or you are mad. How can we cross that place? We should be dashed to pieces before we had gone ten yards. Thus, boss, we must sit each of us on one of the flat stones that lie around here. Then the stone will take us across of itself. I know for I have tried it. Do you mean to tell me that you have been over there on a rock? No, boss, but I have sent three stones over, two crossed safely. I watched them go the whole way, and one vanished in the middle. I think that there is a hole there, but we must risk that. If the stone is heavy enough, it will jump it. If not, then we shall go down the hole and be no more troubled. Great heaven, said Leonard wiping his forehead with the back of his hand. This is practical tobogganing with a vengeance. Is there no other way? I can see none, boss, except for the birds, and I think that we had better stop talking and make ready, for the priests are still behind us. If you will watch on the neck here so that we are not surprised, I will seek stones to carry us. How about this man, said Leonard, pointing to Nam? who lay face downwards on the snow, apparently in a dead faint. Oh, we must keep him a while, boss. He may be useful if those priests come. If not, I will talk with him before we start. He is asleep and cannot run away. Then Leonard went to the top of the neck, which was distant some twenty yards, and Otter began to search for stones suitable to his purpose. As for Juana, she turned her back to the ice bridge, at which she scarcely dared to look, and sat herself upon a rock. In doing so, the jewels in the bag struck against her knee and jingled. And the thought came into her mind that she would examine them while she waited, partly because she desired to distract her thoughts from the vision of this new and terrible ordeal which lay before her, and partly to gratify and not unnatural curiosity. Opening the mouth of the bag, she thrust her fingers into it, and one by one drew out the biggest gems, which were jumbled together there, placing them on the rock beside her. In less than a minute she was feasting her eyes upon such a collection of priceless jewels as had never before gladdened the sight of any white woman, even in her wildest dreams. Indeed, till now, Juana had not thought it possible that stones so splendid could exist on the hither side of the walls of heaven. First there were great sapphires, roughly squared, and two enormous round star rubies. These had formed the eyes of the Colossus, which were removed on the morrow of their arrival, the star rubies representing the blood-red pupils. Then there was a heart-shaped ruby of perfect color, and without flaw, almost as large as a jackdaw's egg, which on the days of sacrifice had adorned the breast of the chief priests of the people of the mist for many generations. Next came the greatest wonders of this treasure, two marvelous stones, one a sapphire and one a ruby, fashioned respectively into models of the statue of the dwarf and of the hideous shape of the water-dweller. Then there were others, dozens of them, some rudely cut and polished, and some as they came from the earth, but every one of them 
singled out for its remarkable size and flawlessness or its perfect fire and beauty. Juana arranged them in rows and stared at them with ecstasy. Where is the woman who would not have done so? Till in contemplating them, she even forgot the present terrors of her position, forgot everything except the gorgeous loveliness and infinite value of the wealth of gems, which she had been the means of winning for Leonard. Among other things that passed from her mind at this moment was the presence of Nam, who, overcome by rage and exhaustion, lay in a seeming faint upon the snow within twelve paces of her. She never saw him lift his head and look at her with an expression as cold and cruel as that which Otter had seen in the eyes of the water-dweller when he lifted his head from its bed of rock. She never saw him roll slowly over and over across the snow towards her, pausing a while between each turn of his body, for now she was occupied in replacing the jewels one by one into their bag of leather. At last all were in, and with a sigh, for it was sad to lose sight of objects so beautiful, Juana drew the mouth of the bag tight and prepared to place it round her neck. At this moment it was that a hand, withered and lean with age, passed beneath her eyes and swiftly, as the snatch of an eagle's talon, seized the bag and rent it from her grasp. She sprang up with a cry of dismay. And well might she be dismayed, for there running from her with incredible speed was Nam, the jewels in his hand. Otter and Leonard heard her cry, and thinking that the priest was escaping, sped to cut him off. But he had no idea of escape, at least not of such an escape as they expected. Some forty yards from where Juana had been sitting, a little promontory of rock jutted out over the unclimbable gulf below them, and towards this spot Nam directed his steps. Running along the ridge he halted at its end. Indeed he must do, unless he would fall a thousand feet or more to the bottom of the ravine beneath. Then he turned and faced his pursuers, who by now had reached the edge of the cliff. Come one step nearer, he cried, and I will let this bag fall whence you shall never recover it, for no foot can tread those walls of rock, and there is water at the bottom of the gulf. Leonard and Otter stopped, trembling for the fate of the jewels. Listen, deliverer, cried Nam, you came to this land to seek these trinkets, is it not so? And now you have found them, and would be gone with them. Before you go, you wish to kill me for vengeance' sake, because I have shown you to be cheats, and have sought to offer you up to those gods whom you have blasphemed. But the red stones you desire are in my hands, and if I unclasp my fingers, they will be lost to you and all the world forever. Say now, if I bring them back to you in safety, will you swear to give me my life and suffer me to go my ways in peace? Yes, we will swear it, answered Leonard, who could not conceal the anguish of his anxiety. Come back, Nam, and you shall depart unharmed. But if you let the stones fall, then you shall follow them. You swear it, said the priest contemptuously. You are come to this, that you will sacrifice your revenge to satisfy your greed. O white man with a noble heart, now I will outdo you. For I who am not noble, will sacrifice my life to disappoint you of your desires. What? Shall the ancient holy treasure of the people of the mist be stolen by two white thieves and their black hound? Never. I would have killed you all had time been granted to me. But in that I failed, and I am glad that I have failed, for now I will deal you a bitterer blow than any death. May the curse of Yal and Aka cleave to you, you dogs without a kennel. May you live outcasts and die in the dirt, and may your fathers and your mothers and your children spit upon your bones as I do. Farewell. And shaking his disengaged hand at them, he spat toward them. Then, with a sudden motion, Nam hurled himself backward off the point of the rock and vanished into space, bearing the treasure with him. 
For a while, the three stood aghast and stared at each other, and the point of rock, which had been occupied by the venerable form of the late high priest, then Juanna, sank down upon the snow, sobbing. "'It is my fault,' she wailed, "'all my fault. Just now I was boasting to myself that I had won a wealth for you, and I have lost everything, and we have suffered for nothing, and, Leonard, you are a beggar. Oh, it is too much, too much.' "'Go out there, Otter,' said Leonard in a hoarse voice, pointing to the place where Nam had hurled himself, and see whether there is any chance of our being able to climb down into the gulf. The dwarf obeyed, and presently returned, shaking his head. It is impossible, boss, he said. The walls of rock are sheer, as though they had been cut with a knife. Moreover, there is water at the bottom of them, as the old wizard said, for I can hear the sound of it. Oh, boss, boss, why did you not kill him at first, or let me kill him afterwards? Surely I told you that he would bring evil on us. Well, they are gone, and we can never find them again. So let us save our lives, if we may, for after all these are more to us than bright stones. Come now and help me, boss, for I have found two flat rocks that will serve our turn, a big one for you and the shepherdess, since doubtless she will fear to make the journey alone and a smaller one for myself. Leonard followed him without a word. He was too heartbroken to speak, while Juanna rose and returned to the spot where Nam had robbed her. Looking up presently, her eyes still blurred with tears, she saw Leonard and the dwarf laboriously pushing two heavy stones across the snow towards her. "'Come, do not cry, Juanna,' said Leonard, ceasing from his labors, and laying his hand kindly upon her shoulder. They are gone, and there is an end to it. Now we must think of other things. Oh, she answered, if only you had seen them. You would never stop crying all your life. Then I dare say that the fit will be a short one, replied Leonard grimly, glancing at the awful bridge which stretched between them and safety. Listen, Juana. You and I must lie upon this stone, and it will, so says Otter, carry us across to the other side of the ravine. I cannot, I cannot, she gasped. I shall faint and fall off. I am sure that I shall. But you must, Juana, answered Leonard. At least you must choose between this and returning to the city of the mist. I will come, she said. I know that I shall be killed, but it is better than going back to those horrible priests, and besides, it does not matter now that I have lost the jewels. Jewels are not everything, Juana. Listen, Shepherdess, put in Otter. The thing is easy, though it looks difficult. All that you have to do is shut your eyes and lie still. Then the stone will carry you over. I am not afraid. I will go first to show you the way, and where a black dwarf can pass, there you white people where so much braver can follow. But before I start, I will tie you and the Deliverer together with my cord, so that you will feel safer. Then Otter dragged both stones to the very verge of the incline, and having passed the rope about the waists of Juana and Leonard, he prepared himself for the journey. Now, Deliverer, he said, when I am safe across, all that you must do is to lie flat upon the stone, both of you, and push a little with the spear. Then, before you know it, you will be on my side. All right, said Leonard doubtfully. Well, I suppose that you had better start. Waiting won't make the matter any easier. Yes, boss, I will go now. Ah, little did I think that I should ever be forced to take such a ride as this. Well, it will be something to make songs about afterwards and Otter laid himself face downwards on the stone with a little laugh, though Leonard noticed that, however brave his spirit might be, he could not prevent his flesh from revealing its natural weakness, for it quivered pitifully. Now, boss, he said, gripping the edges of the stone with his large hands, when I give the word 
Do you push gently, and then you will see how a blackbird can fly. Put your head lower, boss. Leonard obeyed, and the dwarf whispered in his ear. I only want to say, boss, in case we should not meet again, for accidents will happen even on the safest roads, that I am sorry that I made such a pig of myself yonder. It was so dull down there in that hole of a palace, and the fog made me see all things wrong. Moreover, drink and a wife have corrupted many a better man. Don't answer, boss, but start me, for I am growing afraid. Placing his hand at the back of the stone, Leonard gave it a slight push. It began to move, very slowly at first, then more fast and faster yet, till it was rushing over the smooth ice pathway with a whirling sound like that produced by the flight of a bird. Presently it had reached the bottom of the first long slope, and was climbing the gentle rise opposite, but so slowly that for a while Leonard thought that it was going to stop. It crossed its brow, however, and vanished for a few seconds into a dip where the watchers could not see it. Then it appeared again at the head of the second and longest slope, of which the angle was very steep. Down this the stone rushed like an arrow from a bow, till it reached the narrow waist of the bridge, whereof the general conformation bore some resemblance to that of a dead wasp lying on its back. Indeed, from where Leonard and Juana stood, the span of ice at this point seemed to be no thicker than a silver thread, while Otter and the stone might have been a fly upon the thread. Now of a sudden Leonard distinctly saw the rock sledge and its living burden, which just then was traveling its swiftest, move upward as though it had leaped into the air, and then continue its course along the rising place which represented the throat of the wasp, till at length it stopped. Leonard looked at his watch. The time occupied by the transit was just fifty seconds, and the distance could not have been much less than half a mile. See, he cried to Juana, who all this while had sat with her hand before her eyes, to shut out the vision of the dwarf's dreadful progress. He has crossed safely, and he pointed to a figure that appeared to be dancing with glee upon the breast of the snow slope. As he spoke, a faint sound reached their ears, for in those immense silences sound can travel far. It was Otter shouting, and his words seemed to be, Come on, boss, it is easy. I am glad he was safe, said Juana faintly, but now we must follow him. Take my handkerchief, Leonard, and tie it over my eyes, please, for I cannot bear to look. The idol's head was nothing to this. Leonard obeyed her, bidding her not to be afraid. Oh, but I am terribly afraid, she answered. I never was so much frightened in all my life, and I, I have lost the jewels. Leonard, do forgive me for behaving so badly to you. I know that I have behaved badly in many ways, though I have been too proud to admit it before. But now, when I am going to die, I want to beg your pardon. I hope you will think kindly of me, Leonard, when I am dead, for I do love you with all my heart, indeed I do. And tears began to roll down beneath the bandage. Dearest, he answered, kissing her tenderly, as we are tied together, it seems that if you die, I must die too. Do not break down after you have borne so much. It is the jewels, she sobbed, the jewels. I feel as though I have committed a murder. Oh, bother the jewels, said Leonard. We can think about them afterwards. And he advanced towards the flat stone, Juana feeling the while as though they were two of Carrier's victims about to know the marriage of the Loire. As they came to the stone, Leonard heard a sound behind him, a sound of footsteps muffled by the snow, and glancing round, he saw Soa rushing towards them, almost naked, a spear wound in her side, and the light of madness shining in her eyes. Get back, he said sternly, or, and he lifted the great spear. 
Oh, shepherdess, she wailed, take me with you. Shepherdess, for I cannot live without you. Tell her to go away, said Juana, recognizing the voice. I never want to see her any more. You hear, Soa, answered Leonard. Stay. How is it gone yonder? Speak truly. I do not know, deliverer. When I left, Olfen and his brother still held the mouth of the tunnel and were unhurt, but the captain was dead. I slipped past them and got this as I went. And she pointed to the gash in her side. If he can hold out a little longer, help may reach him, muttered Leonard. Then, without more words, he laid himself and Juanna face downwards on the broad stone. Now, Juanna, he said, we are going to start. Grip fast with your right hand, and see that you do not leave go of the edge of the stone, or we shall both slip off it. Oh, take me with you, shepherdess, take me with you, and I will be wicked no more, but serve you as of old, shrilled the voice of Soa, in so despairing a cry that the rocks rang. Hold fast, said Leonard, through his set teeth, as, disengaging his right hand, from about Juana's waist, he seized the handle of the spear and pressed its broad blade against the knob of rock behind them. Now the stone, that was balanced on the very verge of the declivity, trembled beneath them, and now, slowly and majestically, as a vessel starting from her slips when the launching cord is severed, it began to move down the icy way. For the first second, it scarcely seemed to stir, then the motion grew palpable, and at that instant Leonard heard a noise behind him, and felt his left foot clasped by a human hand. There was a jerk that nearly dragged them off the sledge, but he held fast to the front edge of the stone, and though he could still feel the hand upon his ankle, the strain became almost imperceptible. End of chapter 38「Thirty Nine of the People of the Mist」by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Passing of the Bridge. Lifting his head very cautiously, Leonard looked over his shoulder, and the mystery was explained. In her madness and the fury of her love for the mistress, whom she had outraged and betrayed, Soa had striven to throw herself upon the stone with them so soon as she saw it commence to move. She was too late, and feeling herself slipping forward, she grasped despairingly at the first thing that came to her hand, which chanced to be Leonard's ankle. Now she must accompany them upon their awesome journey, only, while they rode upon the stone, she was dragged after them upon her breast. A flash of pity passed through Leonard's brain, as he realized her fearful plight. Then for a while he forgot all about her, since his attention was amply occupied with his own and Juana's peril. Now they were rushing down the long slope with an ever-increasing velocity, and now they breasted the first rise, during the last ten yards of which, as in the case of Otter, the pace of the stone slowed down so much in proportion to the progressive exhaustion of its momentum, that Leonard thought they were coming to a standstill. Then it was that he kicked out viciously, striving to free himself from the weight of Soa, which threatened to bring them to a common ruin. But she clung to him like ivy to a tree, and he desisted from his efforts, fearing he should cause their sledge to alter its course. On the very top of the rise, the motion of the stone decreased almost to nothingness, then, little by little, increased once more, as they traversed a short, sharp dip, the same in which they had lost sight of Otter, to be succeeded by a gentle rise. So far, though exciting and novel, their journey had been comparatively safe, for the path was broad and the ice perfectly smooth. Its terrors were to come. Looking forward, Leonard saw that they were at the commencement of a decline, measuring four or five hundred yards in length, and so steep that, 
even had it offered a good foothold, human beings could scarcely have stood upon it. As yet the tongue of ice was fifty paces or more in width. But it narrowed rapidly as it fell, till at length, near the opposite shore of the ravine, it fined away to a point like that of a great white needle, and then seemed to break off altogether. Now they were well under way, and now they sped down the steep green ice at a pace that can hardly be imagined, though perhaps it is sometimes equaled by an eagle rushing on its quarry from some vast height of air. Indeed, it is possible that the sensations of an eagle making his headlong descent and those of Leonard may have been very similar with the important exception that the bird feels no fear, whereas absolute terror are the only words wherewith to describe the mental state of the man. So smooth was the ice and so precipitous its pitch that he felt as though he were falling through space, unsupported by anything, for traveling at that speed the friction of the stone was imperceptible. Only the air shrieked as they clove it, and Juana's long tresses, torn by it from their fastenings, streamed out behind her like a veil. Down they went, still down. Half, two-thirds of the distance was done. Then he looked again and saw the horror that lay before them. Already the bridge was narrow, barely the width of a small room. Sixty yards further on, it tapered to so fine a point that their stone would almost cover its breadth, and beneath it on either side yawned that unmeasured gulf wherein Nam was lost with the jewels. Nor was this all, for at its narrowest the ice span was broken away for a space of ten or twelve feet, to continue on the further side of the gap for a few yards at a somewhat lower level, and then run upwards at a steep incline to the breast of the snow where Otter sat in safety. On they whizzed, ice beneath them and before them, and ice in Leonard's heart, for he was frozen with fear. His breath had left him because of the rush of their progress, but his senses remained painfully acute. Involuntarily, he glanced over the edge of the stone, saw the sheer depths below him, and found himself wondering what was the law that kept their sledge upon this ribbon of ice where it seemed so easy for it to whirl off into space. Now the gap was immediately in front of them. God help us, he murmured, or rather thought, for there was no time for words, and they had left the road of ice and were flying through the air as though the stone which carried them were a living thing that, seeing the peril, had gathered up its energies and sprung forward for its life. What happened? Leonard never knew for certain, and Otter swore that his heart leaped from his bosom and stood in front of his eyes, so that he could not see. Before they touched the further point of ice, while they were in the air, indeed, they, or rather Leonard, heard a hideous scream, and felt a jerk so violent that his hold of the stone was loosened, and it passed from beneath them. Then came a shock, less heavy than might have been expected, and, lo, they were spinning onwards down the polished surface of the ice, while the stone which had borne them so far sped on in front like a horse that has thrown its rider. Leonard felt the rubbing of the ice burn him like a hot iron. He felt also that his ankle was freed from the hand that had held it. Then for some minutes he knew no more, for his senses left him. When they returned, it was to hear the voice of Otter crying, Lie still, lie still, boss. Do not stir for your life. I come. Instantly he was wide awake, and moving his head ever so little, saw their situation. Then he wished that he had remained asleep, for it was this. The impetus of their rush had carried them almost to the line where the ice stopped and the rock and snow began. Within some fifteen feet of it, indeed. But those fifteen feet were of the smoothest ice and very sheer, so smooth and sheer that no man could hope to climb them. Below them 
the slope continued for about thirteen or fourteen yards till it met the corresponding incline that led to the gap in the bridge. On this surface of ice they were lying spread-eagled. For a moment Leonard wondered how it was that they did not slide back to the bottom of the slope, there to remain till they perished, for without ropes and proper implements no human being could scale it. Then he saw that a chance had befallen them, which in after days he was wont to attribute to the direct intervention of Providence. It will be remembered that when they started, Leonard had pushed the rock off with a spear, which often had given them. This spear he drew in again as they began to move, placing it between his chest and the stone. For he thought that it might be of service to him should they succeed in crossing the gulf. When they were jerked from the sledge and left the slide along the ice on the further side of the gap, in obedience to the impetus given to them by the frightful speed at which they were traveling, the spear, in obeying the same laws of motion, accompanied them, but being of a less specific gravity, lagged behind in the race, just as a stone, which was heaviest, outstripped them. As it happened, near the top of the rise there was a fissure in the ice, and in this fissure the weapon had become fixed, its weighted blade causing it to assume an upright position. When the senseless bodies of Leonard and Juana had slid as far up the slope as the unexpected energy of their impetus would allow, naturally enough they began to move back again in accordance with the laws of gravity. Then it was, as luck would have it, that the spear, fixed in the crevice of the ice, saved them from destruction, for it chanced that the descent of their two forms, passing on either side of it, was checked by the handle of the weapon, which caught the hide rope whereby they were bound together. All this Leonard took in by degrees, also he discovered that Juana was either dead or senseless. At the time he could not tell which. "'What are you going to do?' he asked Otter, who by now was on the verge of the ice fifteen feet above them. "'Cut steps and pull you up, boss,' answered the dwarf cheerfully. "'It will not be easy,' said Leonard, glancing over his shoulder at the long slope beneath. "'And if we slip or the rope breaks—' "'Do not talk of slipping, boss,' replied Otter, as he began to hack at the ice with the priest's heavy knife. "'And as for the rope, if it was strong enough for the water-dweller to drag me round the pool by, it is strong enough to hold you, too.' although it is seen somewhere. I only wish I had such another, for then this matter would be simple. Working furiously, Otter hacked at the hard surface of the ice. The first two steps he hallowed from the top of the slope, lying on his stomach. After this, difficulties presented themselves, which seemed inserpable, for he could not chip at the ice when he had nothing by which to support himself. "'What is to be done now?' said Leonard. "'Keep cool, boss, and give me time to think.' And for a moment Otter squatted down and was silent. "'I have it,' he said presently, and rising, he took off his goatskin cloak and cut it into strips, each strip measuring about two inches in width by two feet six inches in length. These strips he knotted together firmly, making a serviceable rope of them, long enough to reach to where Leonard and Juana were suspended on the stout handle of the spear. Then he took the stake which had already done him such good service, and sharpening its point, fixed it as deeply as he could into the snow and earth on the border of the ice belt, and tied the skin rope to it. Now, boss, he said, all is well, for I can begin from the bottom and without further words he let himself down till he hung beside them. "'Is the shepherdess dead, boss?' he asked, glancing at Juana's pale face and closed eyes. "'Or does she only sleep?' "'I think that she is in a swoon,' answered Leonard. "'But for heaven's sakes be quick, Otter, for I am being frozen on this ice. What is your plan now?' "'This, boss, 
to tie about your middle the end of the rope that I have made from the cloak, then to undo the cord that binds you and the shepherdess together, and return to the top of the slope. Once there, I can pull her up by the hide line, for it is strong, and she will slip easily over the ice, and you can follow. Good, said Leonard. Then hanging by one hand, the dwarf managed, with such assistance as Leonard could give him, to knot beneath Leonard's arms the end of the rope which he had constructed from the skin garment. Next he set to work to untie the hide cord, thereby freeing him from Juana. And now came the most difficult and dangerous part of the task, for Leonard suspended from the shaft of the spear by one hand, must support Juana's senseless form with the other. While Otter made shift to drag himself to the summit of the ice, holding the hide line in his teeth, the spear bent dreadfully, and Leonard did not dare to put any extra strain upon the roughly fastened cord of goatskin by which the dwarf was hauling himself up the ice, for, if it gave, they must all be precipitated to the dip below, there to perish miserably. Faint and frozen as he was, it seemed hours to him before Otter reached the top and called to him to let go of Juana. Leonard obeyed, and seating himself on the snow, his feet supported by the edge of the ice, the dwarf put out his strength and began to pull her up. Strong as he was, it proved as much as he was able to do. Indeed, had Juana lain on any other material than ice, he could not have done it at all. But in the end he succeeded, and with a gasp of gratitude, Leonard saw her stretched safe upon the snow. Now Otter, hastily undoing the cord from Juana's waist, made it into a running noose, which he threw down to Leonard, who placed it over his shoulders. Having lifted the spear from the cleft in which it stood, he commenced his ascent. His first movements cost him a pang of agony, and no wonder, for the blood from wounds that had been caused by the friction of his flesh as he was hurled along the surface of the slide had congealed, freezing his limbs to the ice whence they could not easily be loosened. The pain, sharp as it was, did him good, however, for it aroused his benumbed energies and enabled him to drag on the goatskin cord with all his strength, while Otter tugged at that which was beneath his arms. Well, for him was it that the dwarf had taken the precaution of throwing down the second line, for presently Otter's stake, which had no firm hold in the frozen earth, came out and slid away, striking Leonard as it passed, and bearing the knotted lengths of the cloak with it. The dwarf cried aloud, and bent forward, as though he were about to fall. By a fearful effort, he recovered himself, and held fast the rope in his hand, while Leonard, suspended by it, swung to and fro on the surface of the ice, like the pendulum of a clock. Then followed the most terrible moments of all their struggles against the difficulties of this merciless place. The dwarf held fast above, and Leonard, ceasing to swing, lay with hands and legs outstretched on the face of the ice. Now, boss, said Otter, be brave, and when I pull, do you wiggle forward. He tugged till the thin hide rope stretched, while Leonard clawed and kicked at the ice with his toes, knees, and disengaged hand. Alas, it gave no hold. He might as well have tried to climb a dome of plate glass at an angle of sixty degrees. Rest a while, boss, said the dwarf, whose breath was coming in great sobs. Then make a nick in the ice with the blade of the spear, and when next I pull, try to set some of your weight upon it. Leonard did as he was bid without speaking. Now, said the dwarf, and with a push and a struggle, Leonard was two feet higher up the incline. Again the process was repeated, and this time he got his left hand into the lowest of the two steps that Otter had hacked with the knife. And once more they paused for breath. A third effort 
the fiercest of them all, a clasping of hands, and he was lying trembling like a frightened child above the glacier's lip. The ordeal was over, that danger was done with, but at what cost? Leonard's nerves were completely shattered. He could not stand. His face was bleeding, his nails were broken, and the bone of one knee was exposed by the friction of the ice, to say nothing of the shock to the system and the bruises which he had received when he was hurled from the stone. Otter's condition was a little better, but his hands were cut by the rope, and he was utterly exhausted with the toil and the strain of suspense. Indeed, of the three, Juana had come off by far the best, for she swooned at the very beginning of the passage of the bridge, and when they were jerked from the stone, being lighter than Leonard, she had fallen upon him. Moreover, the thick goat-skin cloak which was wrapped about her had protected her from all hurt beyond a few trifling cuts and bruises. Of their horrible position, when they were hanging to the spear, and the rest of the adventure, including the death of Soa, she knew nothing, and it was well, for her reason, that this was so. "'Otter,' murmured Leonard in a shaking voice, "'have you lost that gourd of spirit?' "'No, boss, it is safe.' "'Thank heaven,' he said. "'Hold it to my lips, if you can.' The dwarf lifted it with a trembling hand, and Leonard gulped down the fiery liquor. "'That's better,' he said. "'Take some yourself.' "'Nay, boss, I have sworn to touch drink no more,' Otter answered, looking at the gourd longingly. "'Besides, you and the shepherdess will want it all. I have some food here, and I will eat.' "'What happened to Soa, Otter?' "'I could not see rightly, boss. I was too frightened, and much more frightened than I had been when I rode the stone myself. But I think that her legs caught in the ice on this side of the hole.' and so she fell. It was a good end for her, the vicious old cow, he added, with a touch of satisfaction. It was very near being a bad end for us, answered Leonard, but we have managed to come out of it alive somehow. Not for all the rubies in the world would I cross that place again. Nor I, boss. Wow, it was awful. Now my stomach went through my head, and now my head went through my stomach and the air was red and green and blue, and devils shouted at me out of it. Yes, and when I came to the hole, there I saw the water-dweller, all fashioned in fire, waiting, with an open mouth to eat me. It was the drink that made me think of these things, boss, and that is why I have sworn to touch it no more. Yes, I swore it, as I flew through the air, and saw the flaming water-dweller beneath me. And now, boss, I am a little rested, so let us try and wake up the shepherdess and get us gone. Yes, said Leonard, though I am sure I do not know where we are to go to. It can't be far, for I am nearly spent. Then crawling to where Juana lay wrapped in her cloak, Otter poured some of the native spirit down her throat, while Leonard rubbed her hands. Presently this treatment produced its effect for she sat up with a start, and seeing the ice before her, began to shriek, saying, "'Take me away. I can't do it, Leonard. I can't, indeed.' "'All right, dear,' he answered. "'You have done it. We are over.' "'Oh,' she said, "'I am thankful. But where is Soa? I thought that I heard her throw herself down behind us.' "'Soa's dead,' he answered. She fell down the gulf and nearly pulled us with her. I will tell you about it afterwards.' You are not fit to hear it now. Come, dear, let us be going out of this accursed place. Juana staggered to her feet. I am so stiff and sore that I can hardly stand, she said. But, Leonard, what is the matter with you? You are covered with blood. I will tell you afterwards, he replied again. Then Otter collected their baggage, which consisted chiefly of the hide line and the spear and they crawled forward up the snow slope. Some twenty or thirty yards ahead of them, and almost side by side, lay the two glacier stones on which they had passed the bridge, and near them those which Otter had dispatched 
as pioneers on the previous morning. They looked at them wondering. Who could have believed that these inert things, not an hour before, had been speeding down the icy way quicker than any express train that ever traveled, and they with them? One thing was certain. Did they remain unbroken for another two or three million years, and that is a short life for a stone, they would never again make so strange a journey. Then the three toiled onto the top of the snow slope, which was about four hundred yards away. Look, boss, said Otter, who had turned to gaze fond farewell at the gulf behind. There are people yonder on the further side. He was right. On the far brink of the crevasse were the forms of men, who seemed to be waving their arms in the air and shouting. But whether these were the priests who, having overcome the resistance of Olfen, had pursued the fugitives to kill them, or the soldiers of the king who had conquered the priests, the distance would not allow them to see. The fate of Olfen and the future domestic history of the people of the mist were now sealed books to them, for they never heard any more of these matters, nor are they likely to do so. Then the travelers began to descend from field to field of snow, the great peak above alone remaining to remind them that they were near to the country of the mist. Once they stopped to eat a little of such food as they had with them, and often enough to rest, for their strength was small. Indeed, as they dragged themselves wearily forward, each of the men holding Juana by the hand, Leonard found himself wondering how it came about, putting aside the bodily perils from which they had escaped, that they had survived the exhaustion and the horrors, physical and mental, of the last forty-eight hours. But there they were, still alive, though in a sorry plight, and before evening they found themselves below the snow line in a warm and genial climate. I must stop, said Juana, as the sun began to set. I can drag myself no further. Leonard looked at Otter in despair. There's a big tree yonder, boss, said the dwarf, with an attempt at cheerfulness, and water by it. It is a good place to camp, and here the air is warm. We shall not suffer from cold. Nay, we are lucky indeed. Think how we passed last night. They reached the tree, and Juana sank down, half fainting against its bowl. With difficulty, Leonard persuaded her to swallow a little meat and a mouthful of spirit, and then, to his relief, she relapsed into a condition which partook more of the nature of stupor than of sleep. End of chapter 39《Chapter Forty of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Otter's Farewell. The night which followed, Leonard is wont to declare, proved to be the very worst that he ever spent in his life. Notwithstanding his intense weariness, he could not sleep. His nerves were too shattered to allow of it. Whenever he shut his eyes, he saw himself hanging head downwards over the oubliette in the cell beneath the idol, or flying through the air across the dreadful gap of the ice bridge, or in some other position of terror similar to those with which they had made such intimate acquaintance of late. Did these visions cease? From time to time he seemed to hear the voice of Francisco bidding him farewell the yell of Soa falling to her dreadful death, or Nam raving his last defiance at them. Also his hurts, which were many, gave him great pain, and though the climate here was mild, the breeze from the snow heights chilled him through, and they had not even a match wherewith to light a fire and scare the wild beasts that roared about them. Rarely have three human beings been in a position more desolate and desperate than that in which they found themselves this night, exhausted, unarmed, almost without food or clothing, and wandering, they knew not where, through the vastness of Central Africa. Unless some help was found them, 
as Leonard was aware, they must perish of starvation, by the fangs of lions or the spears of natives. It was impossible that they could live through another week, and the thought came into his mind that it would be well for them if they died that night and had done with it. It would be well, yes, and it would have been better if he had been laid by the side of his brother Tom, before he ever listened to Soa's accursed tale of the people of the mist and their treasures of rubies. Only then he would never have known Juanna, for she must have died in the slave camp. This was the fruit of putting faith in the visions of dying men, and yet it was strange he had nearly got the money, and by the help of a woman, for those rubies would have sufficed to buy back Outram ten times over. But alas, nearly is not quite. That dream was done with, and even if they escaped, it would be to find himself more utterly beggared than before, for now he would be a married beggar. At last the night wore away and the dawn came, but Juanna did not wake until the sun was high. Leonard, who had crept to a little distance, for now he was quite unable to walk, saw her sit up and crawled back to her. She stared at him vacantly and said something about Jane Beach. Then he knew that she was wandering. There was nothing to be done. What could be done in that wilderness with a woman in delirium, except wait for death? Accordingly, Leonard and Otter waited for some hours. Then the dwarf, who was in far the best condition of the three, took the spear, Olfen's gift, and said that he would go and seek for food since their store was exhausted. Leonard nodded, though he knew there was little chance of a man armed with a spear, alone, being able to kill game, and Otter went. Towards evening he returned, reporting that he had seen plenty of buck, but could not get near them, which was just what his master expected. That night they passed hungry, by turns watching Juanna, who was still delirious. At dawn, Otter started out again, leaving Leonard, who had been unable to sleep as on the previous night, crouched at Juana's side, his face buried in his hands. Before noon Leonard chanced to look up, and saw the dwarf reeling towards him, for he also was faint with want of food. Indeed, his great head and almost naked body, through which the skin of which the misshapen bones seemed to start in every direction, presented so curious a spectacle that his master, whose brain was shaken by weakness, began to laugh. "'Don't laugh, boss,' gasped the dwarf. "'Either I am mad, or we are saved.' "'Then I think you must be mad, Otter, for we shall take a deal of saving,' he answered wearily, for he had ceased to believe in good fortune. "'What is it?' "'This, boss. There is a white man coming this way, and more than a hundred servants with him.' They are marching up the mountain slope. You are certainly mad, Otter, Leonard replied. What in the names of Yal and Aka is a white man doing here? I am the only one of that species who has been fool enough to penetrate these regions, I and Francisco. And he shut his eyes and dozed off. Otter looked at him for a while. Then he tapped his forehead significantly and started down the slope again. An hour later... Leonard, still dozing, was awakened by the sound of many voices, and by a hand that shook him not too gently. Awake, boss, said the dwarf, for the hand was his. I have caught the white man and brought him here. Leonard staggered to his feet and saw before him, surrounded by gun-bearers and other attendants, an English gentleman, rather under than over middle age with a round and kindly face tanned by the sun, and somewhat deep-set dark eyes having an eyeglass fixed in one of them, through which its wearer regarded him with much commiseration. "'How do you do, sir?' said the stranger in a pleasant voice. "'So far as I can make out from your servant, you seem to be in a baddish way. By George, there's a lady.' "'How do you do?' answered Leonard. Capital sun helmet, that of yours. I envy it. But you see, 
I have had to go bareheaded lately. And he ran his fingers through his matted hair. Who's the maker of that eight-bore? Looks a good gun. Achmet, said the stranger, turning to an Arab at his side, go to the first donkey and fetch this lord of the earth a pint of champagne and some oatmeal cakes. He seems to want them. Tell the bearers also to bring up my tent and to pitch it there by the water. Quick now. Forty-eight hours had passed, and the benevolent stranger was sitting on a camp stool at the door of his tent, looking at two forms that lay wrapped in blankets and comfortably asleep within it. I suppose they will wake some time, he murmured, dropping his eyeglass and taking the pipe from his mouth. The quinine and champagne have done them a lot of good. There is nothing like quinine and champagne. But what an unconscionable liar that dwarf must be. There is only one thing he can do better, and that is eat. I never saw a chap stow away so much grub, though I must say he looks as though he needed it. Still, allowing for all deductions, it is a precious queer story. Who are they, and what the deuce are they doing here? One thing is clear. I never saw a finer-looking man nor a prettier girl. And he filled his pipe again, replaced the eyeglass in his eye, and began smoking. Ten minutes later, Juana sat up suddenly, whereupon the stranger withdrew out of sight. She looked round her wildly, then, seeing Leonard lying at the further side of the tent, she crept to him and began kissing him, saying, Leonard, thank God that you are still alive. Leonard, I dreamed that we both were dead. Thank God that you are alive. Then the man who had been thus adjured woke up also and returned her caresses. By George, this is quite affecting, said the traveler. I suppose that they are married. If not, they ought to be. Anyway, I'd better clear out for a while. An hour later he returned to find that the pair had made themselves as presentable as soap and water and some few spare garments which he had sent to Leonard would allow, and were now sitting in the sun outside the tent. He advanced, lifting his helmet, and they rose to meet him. I suppose that I'd better introduce myself, he said with some hesitation, for he was a shy man. I am an English traveler, doing a little exploring on my own account, for lack of any other occupation, and my name is Sidney Wallace. Mine is Leonard Ultram, answered Leonard, and this young lady is Miss Juana Rood. Mr. Wallace started and bowed again, so they were not married. We are deeply indebted to you, sir, went on Leonard, for you have rescued us from death. Not at all, answered Mr. Wallace. You must thank that servant of yours, the dwarf, and not me, for if he had not seen us I should have passed a mile or more to the left of you. The fact is that I am rather fond of mountaineering, and seeing this great peak above us, I am told that it is the highest in the Bisa Mushinga Mountains. I thought I might as well have a try at it before I turn homewards, via Lake Nyasa, Livingstonia, Blaintyre, and Quillimane. But perhaps you will not mind telling me how you came to be here. I have heard something from the dwarf, but his tale seems a little too steep. I am afraid you will think ours rather steeper, Mr. Wallace, said Leonard and he proceeded to give him a short outline of their adventures. When he came to their arrival among the people of the mist, and described the inauguration of Otter and Juana as gods in the Temple of the Colossus, he noticed that his auditor had let the eyeglass fall from his round eye, and was regarding him with mild amazement. "'I'm afraid that all this does not interest you,' said Leonard stiffly. "'On the contrary, Mr. Ultram, it interests me very much. I am exceedingly fond of romances, and this is rather a good one. As I thought, it is scarcely worth while to go on, said Leonard again. Well, I could not wonder that you do not believe me. Leonard, interposed Juana quietly, you still have the star ruby. Show it to Mr. Wallace. He did so, somewhat sulkily, and then, 
As he seemed disinclined to say anything more, Juanna took up the tale, showing in evidence of its truth the spear, the frayed rope, and the tattered white robe which she had worn in her character of Aka, and, indeed, still wore beneath poor Francisco's cassock, for she had no other. Mr. Wallace heard her out, then, without making any comment, he rose, saying that he must try to shoot some meat for the camp, and begged that they would make themselves comfortable until his return that evening. Before sundown he reappeared, and coming straight to the tent, asked their pardon for his incredulity. I have been up yonder, he said, following your spore backwards. I have seen the snow bridge and the stones, and the nicks which the dwarf cut in the ice. All is just as you told me. And it only remains for me to congratulate you upon having escaped from the strangest series of dangers that I ever heard of. And he held out his hand, which both Leonard and Juanna shook warmly. By the way, he added, I sent men to examine the gulf for several miles, but they report to me that they found no spot where it would be possible to descend it, and I fear, therefore, that the jewels are lost forever. I confess that I should have liked to try to penetrate into the mist country, but my nerves are not strong enough for the ice bridge, and if they were, stones won't slide uphill. Besides, you must have had about enough of roughing it, and will be anxious to turn your faces towards civilization. So after you have rested another couple of days, I think that we had better start for Quillimane, which, barring accidents, is about three months' march from here. Shortly afterwards they started accordingly, but with the details of their march we need not concern ourselves. An exception must be made, however, in the case of a single event which happened at the mission station at Blaintyre. That event was the wedding of Leonard and Juana in conformance with the ceremonies of their own church. No word of marriage had been spoken between them for some weeks, and yet the thought of it was never out of the minds of either. Indeed, had their feelings been much less tender towards each other than was the case, it would still have been desirable, in view of the extraordinary intimacy into which they had been thrown during the past months that they should become man and wife. Leonard felt that alone as she was in the wide world, nothing short of mutual aversion would have justified him in separating from Juana. And as it was love and not aversion that he entertained towards her, this argument came home to him with overmastering force. Juana, he said to her on the day of their arrival in Blantyre, you remember some words that passed between your father and myself when he lay upon his deathbed to the effect that, should we both wish it, he trusted my honor to remarry you formally as soon as an opportunity might arise. Now the opportunity is here, and I ask you if you desire to take me for your husband, as above everything in the world I desire to make you my beloved wife. She colored to her beautiful eyes and answered in a voice that was almost a whisper. If you wish it, and think me worthy of you, Leonard, you know that I wish it also. I have always loved you, dear. Yes, even when I was behaving worse to you. But there is Jane Beach. I have told you before, Juana, he answered, with some little irritation, and now I tell you again that Jane Beach and I have done with each other. I am sure that I am very glad to hear it, Juana replied, still somewhat dubiously. The rest of that conversation, being of a private character, will scarcely interest the public. When he spoke thus, Leonard little knew after what fashion Jane Beach and he had wound up their old love affair. Two days later, Leonard Ultram took Juana Rood to his wife. To have and to hold, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. To love and cherish till death did them part. And their rescuer, Sidney Wallace, who by now had become their fast friend, gave her away. 
Very curious were the memories that passed through Juana's mind as she stood by her husband's side in the little grass-roofed chapel of Blaintire. For was this not the third time that she had been married, and now only of her own free will? She bethought her of that wild scene in the slave camp, of Francisco who died to save her, and of the blessings which she had called down upon her and this very man. And of that other scene in the rock prison when, to protect Leonard's life, she was wed, according to the custom of the children of the mist, to that true-hearted gentleman and savage, Olfen, their king. Then she awoke with a happy sigh to know that the lover at her side could never be taken from her again until death claimed one of them. "'We shall be dreadfully poor, Leonard,' she said to him afterwards. "'It would have been much better for you, dear, if I had fallen into the gulf instead of the rubies.' "'I am not of your opinion, love,' he answered, with a smile, for he was very happy. "'Hang the rubies. Your price is far above rubies, and no man may struggle against fate. I have always been able to make a living for myself heretofore, and I do not doubt that I shall continue to do so for both of us, and we will leave the rest to Providence. You are more to me, Juana, than any wealth, more even than Outram. That evening Mr. Wallace found Otter gazing disconsolately at the little house in which Leonard and Juana were staying. Are you sad because your master is married, Otter? he asked. No, answered the dwarf, I am glad. For months he has been running after her, and dreaming of her, and now at last he has got her. Henceforth she must dream of him and run after him, and he will have time to think about other people, who love him quite as well. Another month or so went by, while the party journeyed in easy stages toward the coast, and never had wedded lovers a happier honeymoon. Or more perhaps unconventional than passed by Leonard and Juana, though perhaps Mr. Wallace and Otter did not find the contemplation of their raptures a very exhilarating occupation. At last they reached Quillimane in safety, and pitched their camp on some rising ground outside of the settlement, which is unhealthy. Next morning, at daybreak, Mr. Wallace started for the post office, where he expected to find letters. Leonard and Juana did not accompany him, but went for a walk before the sun grew hot. Then it was, as they walked, that a certain fact came home to them, namely, that they could not avail themselves of their host's kindness any longer, and further, that they were quite penniless. When one is moving slowly across the vast African wilds and living on the abounding game, love and kisses seem an ample provision for all wants. But the matter strikes the mind in a different light after the trip is done, and civilization, with its necessities, looms large in the immediate future. "'What are we to do?' Juana asked Leonard in dismay. "'We have no money to enable us to reach Natal or anywhere, and no credit on which to draw.' "'I suppose that we must sell the great ruby,' she answered, with a sigh, though I shall be sorry to part with it. Nobody will buy such a stone here, Juana, and it may not be a real ruby after all. Perhaps Wallace might be willing to advance me a trifle on it, though I hate having to ask him. Then they went back to breakfast, which they did not find an altogether cheerful meal. As they were finishing, Mr. Wallace returned from the town. I have good news, he said. The British India Mail will be here in two days so I shall pay off my men and go up to Aden in her, and thence home. Of course you will come, too, for, like me, I expect you have had enough of Africa for the present. Here are some copies of the weekly edition of the Times. Look through them, Mrs. Ultram, and see the news while I read my letters. Leonard turned aside moodily and lit his pipe, how was he to find money to take even a third-class passage on the British India Mail? But Juana, obeying the instinct that prompts a woman to keep up appearances at all hazards, took one of the papers and opened it, 
although the tears which swam in her eyes would scarcely suffer her to see the print. Thus things went on for ten minutes or more. As she idly turned the pages of two or three issues of the Weekly Times, trying to collect her thoughts and pick up the thread of current events. But it is wonderful how uninteresting and far away those events appear after the reader has been living a life to herself for a year or so, and Juana, preoccupied as she was with her own thoughts, was about to give up the attempt as a failure when the name of Altram started to her eyes. A minute later her two companions heard a sharp exclamation and turned round. "'What is the matter, Mrs. Altram said Wallace, "'has France declared war against Germany, "'or is Mr. Gladstone dead?' "'Oh, no, something much more important than that. "'Listen to this advertisement, Leonard.' "'If Leonard Altram, second son of Sir Thomas Altram, "'Bart, late of Altram Hall, "'who was last heard of in the territory "'to the north of Delagoa, Bay, Eastern Africa, or in the event of his death, his lawful heirs, would communicate with the undersigned, he or they will hear something very greatly to his or their advantage. Thompson and Turner, 2 Albert Court, London, E.C. Are you joking, Juana? said Leonard after a pause. Look for yourself, she answered. He took the paper and read and reread the notice. Well, there is one certain thing, he said, that no one ever stood in greater need of hearing something to his advantage than I do at this moment. For accepting the ruby, which may not be a true stone, we haven't a stiver to bless ourselves with in the world. Indeed, I don't know how I am to avail myself of Messrs. Thompson and Turner's kind invitation, unless I write them a letter and go to live in a Kaffir hut till the answer comes. Don't let that trouble you, my dear fellow, said Wallace. I can get plenty of cash here, and it is very much at your service. I am ashamed to take further advantage of your kindness, answered Leonard, flushing. This advertisement may mean nothing, or perhaps a legacy of fifty pounds, though I am sure I don't know who would leave me even that sum. And then, how should I repay you? Stuff, said Wallace. Well, replied Leonard, beggars must put their pride in their pockets. If you will lend me a couple of a hundred pounds and take the ruby and pledge, I shall be even more grateful to you than I am at present, and that is saying a good deal. On this business basis the matter was ultimately arranged, though within half an hour Wallace handed back the great stone into Juana's keeping, bidding her keep it dark an injunction which she obeyed in every sense of the word, for she hid the ruby where once the poison had lain in her hair. Two busy days went by, and on the third morning a messenger came running from the town to announce that the northward mail was in sight. Then it was that Otter, who had all this while said nothing, advanced solemnly towards Leonard and Juana, holding his hand outstretched. "'What is the matter, Otter?' asked Leonard, who was engaged in helping Wallace to pack his hunting trophies. "'Nothing, boss. I have come to say good-bye to you and the shepherdess, that is all. I wish to go now, before I see the steam-fish carry you away.' "'Go,' said Leonard. "'You wish to go?' Somehow Otter had become so much part of their lives that, even in their preparations to leave for England, neither of them had ever thought of parting from him. Why do you wish to go, he added. Because I am an ugly old black dog, boss, and could be of no further use to you out yonder, and he nodded towards the sea. I suppose you mean that you do not want to leave Africa, even for a while, said Leonard, with ill-concealed grief and vexation. Well, it is hard to part with you like this. Also, he added with a little laugh, it is awkward, for I owe you more than a year's wages, and have not the money to spare to pay you. Moreover, I have taken your passage on the ship. What does the boss say? asked Otter slowly. 
that he has bought me a place in the steamfish? Leonard nodded. Then I beg your pardon, boss. I thought that you had done with me and were going to throw me away like a worn-out spear. So you wish to come, Otter, said Leonard. Wish to come, he answered wonderingly. Are you not my father and my mother, and is not the place where you may be my place? Do you know what I was going to do just now, boss? I was going to climb to the top of a tree and watch the steam fish till it vanished over the edge of the world. Then I would have taken this rope, which already has served me well among the people of the mist, and set it about my throat and hanged myself there in the tree, for that is the best end for old dogs, boss. Leonard turned away to hide the tears which started to his eyes, for the dwarf's fidelity touched him more than he cared to show. Seeing his trouble, Juana took up the talk to cover his confusion. I fear that you will find it cold over yonder, Otter, she said. It is a land of fog, they tell me, and there are none of your own people, no wives or kaffir beer. Also, we may be poor and have to live hardly. A fog I have seen something lately, shepherdess, answered the dwarf, and yet I was happy in the fog, because I was near the boss. Of hard living I have seen something also, and still I was happy because I was near the boss. Once I had a wife and beer in plenty, more than a man could want, and then I was unhappy, because they estranged me from the boss, and he knew that I had ceased to be Otter, his servant, whom he trusted, and had become a beast. Therefore, shepherdess, I would see no more of wives and beer. Otter, you idiot, broke in Leonard brusquely. You had better stop talking and get something to eat for it will be the last meal that you will wish to see for many a day. The boss is right, replied the dwarf. Moreover, I am hungry, for sorrow has kept me from food for these two days. Now I will fill myself full, that I may have something to offer to the black water when he shakes me in his anger. End of chapter 40 Envoy of the People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The End of the Adventure. Six weeks or so had passed when a four-wheeled cab drew up at the door of 2 Albert Court, London, E.C. The progress of this vehicle had excited some remark among the more youthful and lighter-minded denizens of the city for on its box, arrayed in an ill-fitting suit of dittos, and a brown hat, some sizes too small for him, sat a most strange object, whose coal-black countenance, dwarfed frame, and enormous nose and shoulders attracted their ribald observance. "'Look at him, Bill,' said one youth to an acquaintance. "'He's escaped from Madame Tussaud's, he has, painted himself over with Dan Martin's best, and bought a second-hand Guy Fawkes nose. Just then his remarks were cut short, for Otter, having been made to understand by the driver that they had arrived at their destination, descended from the box in a manner so original that it is probably peculiar to the aborigines of Central Africa, and frightened that boy away. From the cab emerged Leonard and Juana, looking very much the better for their sea journey. Indeed, having recovered her health and spirits, and being very neatly dressed in a gray frock, with a wide black hat trimmed with ostrich feathers, Juana looked what she was, a very lovely woman. Entering an outer office, Leonard asked if Messrs. Thompson and Turner were to be seen. "'Mr. Turner is within, sir,' answered a clerk, of venerable appearance. Mr. Thompson, here his glance fell upon Otter, and suddenly he froze up, then added with a jerk, has been dead a hundred years. Thompson, sir, he explained, recovering his dignity, but with his eyes still fixed on Otter, was the founder of this firm. He died in the time of George the Third. That's his picture over the door. 
the person with a hair lip and a snuff box. Indeed, said Leonard, as Mr. Thompson is not available, perhaps you will tell Mr. Turner that a gentleman would like to speak to him. Certainly, sir, said the old clerk, still staring fixedly at Otter, whose aspect appeared to fascinate him as much as that worthy had been fascinated by the eyes of the water-dweller. Have you an appointment, sir? No, answered Leonard. Tell him that it is in reference to an advertisement which his firm inserted in the Times some months ago. The clerk started, wondering if this could be the missing Mr. Outram. That much sought-for individual was understood to have resided in Africa, which is the home of dwarfs and other oddities. Once more he stared at Otter and vanished through a swing door. Presently he returned. Mr. Turner will see you, sir. If you and the lady will please step in. Does this gentleman wish to accompany you? No, said Leonard. He can stop here. Thereupon the clerk handed Otter a tall stool, on which the dwarf perched himself disconsolately. Then he opened the swing door and ushered Leonard and his wife into Mr. Turner's private room. "'Whom have I the pleasure of addressing?' said a bland, stout gentleman, rising from before a table strewn with papers. "'Pray be seated, madam.' Leonard drew from his pocket a copy of the Weekly Times and handed it to him, saying, "'I understand that you inserted this advertisement.' "'Certainly we did,' answered the lawyer, after glancing at it. "'Do you bring me any news of Mr. Leonard Altram?' "'Yes, I do. I am he.' and this lady is my wife. The lawyer bowed politely. This is most fortunate, he said. We had almost given up hope, but of course some proofs of identity will be required. I think that they can be furnished to your satisfaction, answered Leonard briefly. Meanwhile, for the sake of argument, perhaps you will assume that I am the person whom I state myself to be, and inform me to what this advertisement refers. Certainly, answered the lawyer. There can be no harm in that. Sir Thomas Altram, the late baronet, as you are doubtless aware, had two sons, Thomas and Leonard. Leonard, the second son, as a young man, was engaged to, or rather, had some love entanglement with a lady. Really, I forget her maiden name, but perhaps you can inform me of it. Do you happen to mean Miss Jane Beach? said Leonard quietly. At this point Juana turned in her chair and became extraordinarily, indeed, almost fiercely, interested in the conversation. Quite so, Beach was the name. You must excuse my forgetfulness. Well, Sir Thomas's affairs fell into confusion, and after their father's death, Mr. Leonard Altram, with his elder brother Thomas, emigrated to South Africa. In that same year, Miss Jane Beach married a client of ours, Mr. Cohen, whose father had purchased the estate of Ottram from the trustees in bankruptcy. Indeed, said Leonard. Shortly afterwards, when on the lawyer, Mr. Cohen, or rather, Sir Jonas Cohen, succeeded to the estate on the death of his father. Two years ago he died, leaving all his property, real and personal, to his only child, a daughter named Jane with reversion to his widow in fee simple. Within a month of his death, the child Jane also died, and nine months later her mother, Lady Cohen, nee Jane Beach, followed her to the grave. Yes, said Leonard in a dull voice, and hiding his face in his hand. Go on, sir. Lady Cohen made a somewhat peculiar will. Under the terms of that will, she bequeathes the mansion house and estates of Ottram, together with most of her personal property, amounting in all to something over a hundred thousand pounds, to her old friend Leonard Ottram, and the heirs of his body, with reversion to her brother. This will has not been disputed, therefore, if you are Leonard Ottram, I may congratulate you upon being once more the owner of your ancestral estates and a considerable fortune in cash. For a while Leonard was too agitated to speak. 
I will prove to you, he said at last, that I am this person, that is, I will prove it prima facie. Afterwards, you can satisfy yourself of the truth of my statements by the usual methods. And he proceeded to adduce a variety of evidence as to his identity, which need not be set out here. The lawyer listened in silence, taking a note from time to time. I think he said when Leonard had finished that, subject to those inquiries of which you yourself have pointed out the necessity in so grave a matter, I may accept it as proved that you are none other than Mr. Leonard Altram, or rather, he added, correcting himself, if, as I understand, your elder brother Thomas is dead, then Sir Leonard Altram. Indeed, you have so entirely convinced me that this is the case, that I have no hesitation in placing in your hands a letter addressed to you by the late Lady Cohen, and deposit it with me together with the executed will, though, when you have read it, I shall request you to leave that letter with me for the present. By the way, it may interest you to learn, Mr. Turner added, as he went to a safe built into the wall and unlocked its iron door, that we have been hunting for you for a year or more. We even sent a man to Africa, and he tracked you to a spot in some mountains, somewhere north of Delagoa Bay, where it was reported that you, with your brother, Thomas, and two friends were digging for gold. He reached the spot on the night of the ninth of May last year. The very day that I left it broke in, Leonard, and found the site of your camp in three graves. At first our representative thought that you were all dead, but afterwards he fell in with a native who appears to have deserted from your service, and who told him that one of the brothers was dying when he left the camp, but one was still in good health, though he did not know where he had gone. My brother Thomas died on the first of May that year, said Leonard. After that all trace of you was lost, but I still kept on advertising, for missing people have a wonderful way of turning up to claim fortunes, and as you see, the result. Here is the letter, Sir Leonard. Leonard took the document and looked at it, while strange feelings crowded into his mind. This was the first letter that he had ever received from Jane Beach. Also it was the last that he ever could receive. Before I open this, Mr. Turner, he said, for my own satisfaction, I may as well ask you to compare the handwriting of the address with another specimen of it that chances to be in my possession. And producing the worn prayer book from his pocket, Jane's parting gift, he opened it at the fly-leaf and pointed out the inscription to the lawyer, placing the envelope beside it. Mr. Turner took a reading glass and examined first one writing and then the other. These words appear to have been written by the same hand, he said presently. Lady Cohen's writing was peculiar, and it is difficult to be mistaken on the point, though I am no expert. To free you from responsibility with your consent, I myself will open this letter, and he slit the envelope at the top with an ivory paper knife, and, drawing out its contents, he handed them to Leonard. They ran thus. My dearest Leonard, for so I, who am no longer a wife, may call you without shame, seeing that you are in truth the dearest to my heart, whether you be still living or dead, like my husband and my child. This will, which I am to sign tomorrow, will prove to you, if you are yet alive, as I believe to be the case, how deep is my anxiety that you should be re-entered into possession of the ancestral home of which fortune has deprived you. It is with the greatest pleasure that I make you this bequest, and I can do so with a clear conscience, for my late husband has left everything at my absolute disposal, being himself without near relations, in the sad event which has occurred of the death of his daughter, our only child. May you live long enough to enjoy the lands and fortunes which I enabled thus to return to your family, and may your children and their descendants sit at Altram for many a generation to come. 
and now I will talk no more of this matter, for I have an explanation to make and a pardon to ask. It may well be, Leonard, that when your eyes fall upon these lines, you will have forgotten me most deservedly and have found some other woman to love you. No, as I set this down, I feel that it is not true. You will never forget me altogether, Leonard, your first love, and no other woman will ever be quite the same to you as I have been, or at least so I believe in my foolishness and vanity. You will ask what explanation is possible after the way in which I have treated you and the outrage that I have done to my own love. Such as it is, however, I offer it to you. I was driven into this marriage, Leonard, by my late father, who could be very cruel when he chose. To admit this is, as I know, a proof of weakness. So be it. I have never concealed from myself that I am weak. Yet believe me, I struggled while I could. I wrote to you even, but they intercepted my letter, and I told all the truth to Mr. Cohen, but he was self-willed and passionate, and would take no heed of my pleading. So I married him, Leonard, and was fairly happy with him, for he was kindness itself to me, but from that hour I began to die. And now more than six years have passed since the night of our parting in the snow, and the end is at hand, for I am really dying. It has pleased God to take my little daughter, and this last shock proved more than I can bear. And so I go to join her, and to wait with her, till such time as I shall once more see your unforgotten face. That is all I have to say, dear Leonard. Pardon me, and I am selfish enough to add, do not forget me. Jane P.S. Why is it that an affection like ours, which has never borne fruit even, should in the end prove stronger than any other earthly tie. Heaven knows, and heaven alone, how passionately I loved and loved my dead child, and yet, now that my own hour is at hand, it is of you that I think the most, you who are neither child nor husband. I suppose that I shall understand ere long. But, oh, Leonard, 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 if, as I believe, my nature is immortal, I swear that such love as mine for you, however much it may be dishonored and betrayed, is still the most immortal part of it. J. Leonard put down the letter on the table, and again he covered his face with his hands to hide his emotion, for his feelings overcame him as a sense of depth and purity of this dead woman's undying love sank into his heart. May I read that letter, Leonard? asked Juana in a quiet voice. Yes, I suppose so, dear, if you like, he answered, feeling dully that it was better to make a clean breast of the matter at once, and thus to prevent future misunderstandings. Juana took the letter and perused it twice, by which time she knew it as well as she did the Lord's Prayer, nor did she ever forget a single word of it, then she handed it back to the lawyer, saying nothing. "'I understand,' said Mr. Turner, breaking in on a silence which he felt to be painful, "'that you will be able to produce the necessary proofs of identity within the next few days, and then we can get the will proved in the usual form. Meanwhile, you must want money, which I will take the risk of advancing you.' He wrote a check for a hundred pounds and gave it to Leonard. Half an hour later, Leonard and Juana were alone in a room at their hotel, but as yet scarcely a word had passed between them since they left the lawyer's office. "'Don't you see, Leonard,' his wife said almost fiercely, "'it is most abusing. You made a mistake. Your brother's dying prophecy was like a Delphic oracle. It could be taken two ways, and, of course, you adopted the wrong interpretation.' You left Grave Mountain a day too soon. It was by Jane Beach's help that you were to recover Altrum, not by mine. And she laughed sadly. Don't talk like that, dear, said Leonard in a sad voice. It pains me. 
How else am I to talk after reading that letter, she answered, for what woman can hold her own against a dead rival? Now also I must be indebted to her bounty all my days. Oh, if I had not lost those jewels! If only I had not lost those jewels! History does not relate how Leonard dealt with this unexpected and yet natural situation. A week had passed, and Leonard, with Juana at his side, found himself once more in the great hall at Outram, where on a bygone night, many years ago, he and his dead brother had sworn their oath. All was the same, for in this hall nothing had been changed. Jane had seen to that. Their chain to its stand was the Bible, upon which they had registered their vow. There were the pictures of his ancestors gazing down calmly upon him, as though they cared little for the story of his struggles and of his strange triumph over fortune, by the help of a woman. There was the painted window, and its blazoned coat of arms, and its proud mottoes, for heart, home, and honor, and per adua ad astra. He had won the heart and home, and he had kept his honor and his oath. He had endured the toils and dangers, and the crown of stars was his. And yet was Leonard altogether happy as he stood looking on these familiar things? Perhaps not quite, for yonder in the churchyard there was a grave, and within the church a monument in white marble that was wonderfully like one who had loved him and whom he had loved, though time and trouble had written a strange difference on her face. Also, he had failed. He had kept his oath indeed, and fought on till the end was won, but he himself had not won it. What now was his had once belonged to a successful rival, who doubtless little dreamed of the payment that would be exacted from him by the decree of fate. And was Juana happy? She knew well that Leonard loved her truly, but, oh, it was cruel that she who had shared the struggles should be deprived of her reward, that it should be left to another who, if not false, had at least been weak, to give to her husband that which she had striven so hard to win, that which she had won and lost. And harder still was it that in this ancient place, which would henceforth be her home by day and by night, she must feel the presence of the shadow of a woman, a woman sweet and pale, who, as she believed, stood between her and that which she desired above all things, the complete and absolute possession of her husband's heart. Doubtless she overrated the trouble. Men and women do not spend their lives in brooding upon the memories of their first loves. If they did, this would be a melancholy world. But to Juana it was real enough, and remained so for some years. And if a thing is true to the heart, it avails little that reason should give it the lie. In short, now in the hour of their full property, Leonard and Juana were making acquaintance with the fact that fortune never gives with both hands, as the French say, but loves to rob with one while she bestows with the other. Too few is it allowed to be completely miserable, but none to be completely happy. Their good luck had been so overwhelming in many ways that it would have partaken of the unnatural and might well have excited their fears for the future had its completeness been unmarred by these drawbacks which, such as they were, probably they learned to disremember as the years passed over them, bringing them new trials and added blessings. Perhaps a peep into the future will tell us the rest of the story of Leonard and Juana Otram better and more truly than any further chronicling of events. Ten years or so have gone by, and Sir Leonard, now a member of Parliament and the Lord Lieutenant of his county, comes out of church on the first Sunday in May, accompanied by his wife, the stateliest matron in the countryside, and some three or four children, boys and girls together, as healthy as they are handsome. After a glance at a certain grave that lies near to the chancel door, 
they walk homewards across the budding park in the sweet spring afternoon, till a hundred yards or more from the door of Ultram Hall they pause at the gates of a dwelling known as the Corral. Shaped like a beehive, fashioned of straw and sticks, and built by the hands of Otter alone. Basking in the sunshine in front of this hut sits the dwarf himself, cutting broomsticks with a knife out of the straightest of a bundle of ash saplings that lie beside him. He is dressed in a queer mixture of native and European costume, but otherwise time has wrought no change in him. Greeting, boss, he says, as Leonard comes up. Is boss Wallace here yet? No, he will be down in time for dinner. Mind that you are there to wait, Otter. I shall not be late, boss, on this day of all days. Otter, cries a little maid, you should not make broomsticks on Sunday. It is very wrong. The dwarf grins by way of answer, then speaks to Leonard in a tongue that none but he can understand. What did I tell you many years ago, boss, he says? Did I not tell you by this way or by that you should win the wealth, and that the great corral across the water should be yours again, and that the children of strangers should wander there no more? See, it has come true. And he points to the happy group of youngsters. Wow! I, Otter, who am a fool in most things, have proved to be the best of prophets. Yet I will rest content and prophesy no more, lest I should lose my name for wisdom. A few hours later and dinner is over in the larger hall. All servants have gone except Otter, who, dressed in a white smock, stands behind his master's chair. There is no company present save Mr. Wallace, who has just returned from another African expedition, and sits smiling and observant, his eyeglass fixed in his eye as of yore. Juana is arrayed in full evening dress, however, and a great star ruby blazes upon her breast. "'Why have you got the red stone on tonight, mother?' asks her eldest son, Thomas, who with his two sisters has come down to desert. "'Hush, dear,' she answers, as Otter advances to that stand on which the Bible is chained, holding a glass filled with port in his hand. "'Deliverer and shepherdess,' he says, speaking in Susutu, "'on this day eleven years ago, Boss Tom died out yonder. I, who drink wine, but once a year, drink to the memory of Boss Tom, and to our happy meeting with him in the gold house of the great great, and swallowing the port with a single gulp, Otter throws the glass behind him, shattering it on the floor. Amen, says Leonard. Now, love, your toast. I drink to the memory of Francisco, who died to save me, says Juana, in a low voice. Amen, repeats her husband. For a moment there is silence, for Leonard gives no toast. Then the boy Thomas lifts his glass and cries, and I drink to Olfen, the king of the people of the mist, and to Otter, who killed the snake god, and whom I love the best of all of them. Mother, may Otter get the spear and rope, and tell us the story of how he dragged you and father up the ice bridge? End of Envoy Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas End of The People of the Mist by H. Ryder Haggard